Hello everyone, in today's video I will be narrating stories that I found off of reddit. If you enjoyed this video make sure you subscribe to my channel, like this video, and comment something down below. But without further ado, let's get straight into these stories. It was the middle of summer and my parents had left for the weekend to go to our house in the Cape Cod. It's about a two hour drive away so it's no big deal for them to leave me alone for a few days. My mom had some pulled pork and pasta for me to heat up to eat whenever I had some money if I wanted to order a pizza. Things were all good. The first night I was alone, I stayed up till 3 in the morning playing Xbox, so I woke up really late the next day. I checked my phone when I woke up and saw it was a little past 1. I had made plans to play some street hockey with my friends at 3, so I threw myself out of bed and stumbled into the shower. I take really long showers, so when my parents are gone I go mental. I was in there for about 45 minutes on my phone scrolling through reddit and twitter and whatnot, when I heard my front door open. The bathroom is directly up the stairs from the back door, and the thing is pretty loud when it opens and closes. I immediately froze, since obviously I was supposed to be alone. I waited for about 2 minutes, ears trained and trying to hear anything else. Nothing. I figured it was just the wind or maybe my parents were home early, so I turned off the shower, wrapped my towel around myself, and slowly walked down the stairs to check it out. Even though my house is old and each step on the stairs makes a super loud creak, I still took my time and tried to be as quiet as possible. I probably took 45 seconds walking down all 12 of the stairs. So when I get to the second to last stair, right before I could see around the corner to the kitchen, I take a little breath to compose myself. In my mind I knew I was being stupid. There obviously wasn't anything in the kitchen. There was no way I wouldn't have heard another noise and there's no reason for them to still be in the kitchen even if they were burglars or something in the house. After sort of mentally chastising myself for being such a wuss, I sort of chuckled to myself for being so stupid and just normally walked the last two stairs and turned the corner to the kitchen. Standing about two feet away from me in the middle of my kitchen is a man staring straight at me, perfectly still, with a massive smile across his face, just staring at me. The thing I remember most most vividly wasn't his face or his smile but his arms. They weren't just at his side, he held them in the strangest most abnormal position I've ever seen. They were where one would normally hold their arms, but he had rotated them to the point where they were almost completely reversed as well as lifting them up and a little behind himself. Honestly I think I almost had a heart attack right there. Looking back I can realize how creepy the situation was, but in the moment I just took a step towards him and punched him as hard as I could in the jaw, sort of half slapping slash pushing him towards the ground. The second I connected, I beelined up the stairs, dropping my towel in the kitchen with my heart beating out of control. Control. I sprinted into my room and locked the door behind me. I quickly put a chair up against the doorknob like you see in TV. Almost without thinking I immediately called 911 and nearly in tears told the operator what happened. As I sat on the floor of my room in practically the fetal position, staring at the door praying that a cop would be here soon, I noticed the light coming from the gap between my door had stopped. The guy was standing outside of my door. There's no words to describe the feeling I had. I was paralyzed with fear, watching the shadow across the bottom of the door shift in tiny ways. I stayed balled up, staring at the gap, praying the man would go away for what seemed like an hour. All the while, the 911 operator was asking, Hello, sir? Sir, are you there? Hello? I didn't want to make a noise, and even if I wanted to move my arms to bring the phone to my mouth, I don't think I could have. Eventually the light returned to the gap and I heard the faintest of footsteps, slowly creaking the wooden floorboards as he walked down the hall. It was silent for minutes as I just sat there curled up, unable to even speak. I heard banging on the front door and the sound of two officers entering my house. I finally felt safe and I opened the door to the two of the men standing there as I almost cried. Nowadays my parents don't even leave me alone home anymore and I check every lock on the house before going to bed. Even working with sketch artists in a few lineups, the police never found whoever was in my house. I have no idea what he wanted or who he was, but regardless, let's not meet again, ever. I'm 29 now. This story happened 10 years ago at the time I was jobless and I found a job as a security guard in an office building. The office building was in a forested area, away from any busy streets like secluded. The person who had the job before me had a car accident and apparently was paralyzed from the waist down. Nobody was interested in the job since you worked during the night and the office building was so big it was just really boring, but hey a job is a job. Once I started, a supervisor worked me in for a week, what to do, etc. This was my first night working by myself. I came to work and took the shift over from my colleague at 9pm and he told me there will still be some people left in the building. Before I went up to the 15th floor, I closed the main entrance in such a way you could only exit when you're inside, so no outsiders could come in. After I did this, I went up to the 15th floor where these people still worked, to ask them if they needed to go anywhere else in the building, and if not, I could make my round and close off all the other floors, which I did. So I made my rounds and found nothing peculiar. I went back to my front desk, this was around 11.30pm, and the last people who were working on the 15th floor were just leaving. 
and the guy told me he was the last one to leave and wished me good night. Once the last person left, I went up to the 15th floor, checked all the offices and locked it down. I went down to my front desk again since there were no people left. I put on the alarms which work on motion detection and also when you open a fire exit on every floor except the ground floor where my desk was. Within 5 minutes I put the alarm on, on all floors. The alarm went off on the 10th floor and there was nobody on the building. The rule is if an alarm goes off, you first call the security company before you take action. I told them I would investigate the alarm and I would call them back once I checked it out. Otherwise, if I don't call back, they would send a police car to check it out, just as a precaution. I checked the whole 10th floor and I found nothing. Went back to call the security company telling them it was a false alarm. I kid you not, the alarm on the 10th floor went off like 7 times in an hour. And every time I checked the floor, I couldn't find anything out of order or even that there was someone there. Since this was my first day working alone and the alarm went off so many times, the security company thought I was screwing things up and wanted to file a complaint to my boss, which would mean I would lose my job I just had for a week. In retrospect, the following was the dumbest thing I could ever do, because the alarm went off again, since I didn't want to call the security company again and cry wolf, I went up to the 10th floor without informing the security company. The only thing I had on me was a mag light, since security guards in the Netherlands are not allowed to carry guns. I went up to the 10th floor, checked the floor, and as before, found nothing. The only difference now was I pretended to leave, turned off the lights, and stayed on the 10th floor, listening if someone was there. In about 5 minutes, I heard someone or something moving. I was relieved and anxious at the same time. Relieved I wasn't wrong, and that there was something on the floor. Anxious because of what was on the floor. I turned on the lights, and tried to sound as manly as possible, saying something in the line of, I know there is someone here, show yourself. As you can imagine, no response. So stupid I didn't go down to call for help, but stupid me went looking to whatever it was I heard on the 10th floor. I walked to the office I heard the sound from, turned on the lights, and found a little girl who couldn't be older than 13 with long brown hair, in white pajamas squatting and rocking front to back on a desk, looking straight at me. The scary thing was there was no emotion in her face or in her eyes. I collected my nerves and took the girl by the hand. I took her down to the front desk, offered her a coke but she didn't respond whatsoever. The only thing I could do was call my supervisor and told him about what I encountered. My supervisor's response was, stay there I'll be right over. The time I hung up on the phone until my supervisor came, I just had this underbelly feeling with this girl, that there was something really wrong with her. Before my supervisor turned up, he called me and told me to call an asylum which was pretty close to the office building I worked at, just to check if someone was missing. Why would there be a 13 year old girl in an office building with no houses nearby whatsoever? So that's what I did, I called the asylum, asking them if there was someone missing from the asylum, and I got the scariest response you can get. Yes, as a matter of fact, someone is missing. I gave them a description of the girl sitting next to me, and it was in fact the girl who was missing from the asylum. They told me she was really dangerous, and that I should watch my back at all costs. They immediately sent people over to take the little girl with them. A week later, my supervisor told me the story of the girl I found, since he talked with the people from the asylum. It turns out the girl killed her mom and dad and little brother whilst they were asleep, when she was 11. Even in the asylum, she wounded staff members, either by stabbing them with a pencil or in another case biting a piece of an ear off. To this day, we still have no clue how she ever came in the building. We checked all the cameras and there was no footage of her ever entering the building. I grew up in a very safe, very affluent neighborhood. It was unheard of for anyone to lock their cars or houses, and when someone new moved to the neighborhood, it was mere moments before they were welcomed with open arms and open doors. Despite being surrounded by what could be described as one large neighborhood family, my mom was very particular about house rules being followed, one of which was never going out alone. Walking to a friend's house, three of us had to go, so two could walk home together after dropping you off. It was rare, but occasionally just two of us would be able to sneak out from under her watchful eye and run to the corner store a few blocks down for some candy or soda. One sweltering day during the summer, I turned nine. I found myself home alone and restless. I decided to take my sister's cool new 10 speed for a spin around the block a few times. Now, even though I was tall for my age, the bike was still a few inches too big for me. I decided that didn't matter, jumped on and started pedaling. My first stop around the neighborhood went off without a hitch. Birds were chirping, sun was shining, and the wind blowing through my curled hair felt wonderful. Second lap around the block I passed an older, unfamiliar car parked on the side of the road, and the sun reflecting off the huge scrape down the side temporarily shocked my vision into bright blue stripes which I furiously tried to blink away. The third lap, I saw the car pull off the side of the road heading towards me, and a tiny pit of unease began to grow my stomach as the driver slowed when he passed me. I chalked it up to being scared of being caught out being alone, and continued on my way. I picked up speed as I rounded the corner towards my house and I decided to go for one more time around the block, but to make it quick so I'd beat my mom home and avoid the trouble I knew I'd be in if she caught me out alone. I hit the bottom of the hill next to our house with some speed and started to climb to the top, 
slowing more and more the closer I got. By the time I reached the top of the hill, I had to stop and catch my breath, teetering the too tall back at my hip. As I struggled to catch my breath, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. My arms locked on the handlebars, and every inch of my body froze. I had been caught, I just knew it. I heard a car creeping up behind me, and it just had to be my mom, but it wasn't. When relief should have washed over me, the unknown dread only deepened, further stiffening my frozen still limbs. I turned to see the same old car, with the same blinding scratch down the side, slowing down right next to me. The man stopped the car right next to my bike on the wrong side of the street, and through his opening driver door started to ask me if I had seen a stray dog running around, because his had come off the leash and run off. I froze. This cliché question is the one they warned us about in school, the one every kidnapper supposedly uses. I decided if I answered him firmly and rode my bike away that he would know his plan wouldn't work on me, plus he might just really be looking for his dog. This was my plan, my terrified body betrayed that plan and a trembling no is all I could manage. As I fumbled my feet to the pedals of this too big bike, his car door flew open and out he lunged. No, I said again as I wobbled my way past his open car door, his hand brushing the back of my shirt and knocking my back tires I pedaled as fast as I could the 50 feet to the next driveway I saw. I pedaled, legs burning up the drive, running my front tire so hard to my neighbor's front tire that it bent the wheel. My body catapulted over the handlebars and I burst through the neighbor's front door. Eddie, Eddie help. My neighbor was not home. I ran into the kitchen, still calling in hopes I was wrong. What are you doing? A man's voice behind me and I froze. I slowly turned around, not knowing what else to do, and there stood my neighbor's son, home from college. I dissolved into tears, gulping out what happened. He tossed the bent bike into the back of his truck and drove me around the corner to the safety of my home. My mom was home and had the look of death in her eyes until she saw my tear-streaked face. The police were called. The neighbors were called. The car had been spotted frankly circling the block the few minutes following our encounter, but he was gone by the time police arrived. To this day, 20 years later, I still have a hard time riding my bike alone. This all happened when I was 19. I'm not the best looking dude so I've never had much luck with women and I ended up on Tinder. I wasn't having much luck there either until the third month of using it when a blonde woman named Katie messaged me. She was pretty enough that I just dismissed her as a bot. It wasn't until three days later that she messaged me again which was odd because bots almost never messaged more than once. I clicked on her chat and replied, then looked at her profile. What I saw was pretty generic, but it definitely wasn't a bot's profile. We had been talking for like a month when she proposed the idea that I come see her. I was pretty reluctant as she lived nearly 8 hours from me by car, but I had to admit I really did like her quite a bit and I had been thinking about asking her if I could come see her for a while now. After a bit more badgering from her, I finally said that I would take the drive to go see her. At this point, I had no reason to doubt she said who she said she was. We had video chatted every other week and called most days, and I just assumed I got really lucky. Things did get a little weird on the way there though. She kept messaging me, asking me where I was, and making sure I was still coming. At some points, when I took more than 30 minutes to respond, she would send me a slew of annoyed texts. Admittedly, I had chalked this all up to her being nervous about me coming to see her. I was pretty nervous too, so I couldn't blame her. I had a hard time finding the house at first. The directions she gave me were pretty confusing and it was back through a series of gravel and dirt roads and a large thicket of trees. It was still about midday when I came onto an old looking house. A window on the second floor was boarded up but it didn't look abandoned, just worse for wear. Katie's red buggy that she liked to talk about was parked in front of the garage. I took out my phone and texted her that I was here. She only sent a smiley face in return. When I got out of my car to go knock on the door, I noticed someone was looking at me from one of the second floor windows. I found it a little creepy but figured it was just her father or something. She had told me that he comes to stay with her every now and again, so I ignored it and knocked on her door. She answered with a smile and even gave me a kiss which surprised me and I followed her inside. We sat down on her couch and started talking about our plans when I asked her about her dad. You didn't tell me your dad was here, I said. Was that going to be a surprise or... Katie looked confused and told me that her dad wasn't here. I still thought she was keeping up the act and I told her that she didn't have to keep pretending and that I had seen him looking at me through the upstairs window. Katie went pale and said that we had to get out of there now. We both ran out to our cars and when I questioned Katie she informed me that her dad wasn't there and that she had been home alone until I showed up. I called the police and while I was on the phone giving the address, Katie gasped and pointed to the window where I had seen the guy last. He was looking at us from out the window again. I got a better look of him and he seemed older and frail, almost like he hadn't eaten anything in a while. He left the window after he saw that we saw him. The police took half an hour to show up and the whole time Katie was crying and mumbling about how she was an idiot for not keeping her doors locked. When the police finally did show up, one started asking me and Katie questions and the other two searched the house. They came back out a little later and told me and Katie that, while they didn't find anyone, they did find that the back door was hanging open. 
Whoever it was had ran out into the woods, but the cops were sure the house was empty. After the cops left, Katie asked me to stay the night because she was too scared to be in her house alone right now. I gladly did and we slept downstairs on the couch as Katie's bed was the room next to the one the man had been in. Katie had also brought out the shotgun that her father had given her but she never used. I told her it was fine, the man's gone but she insisted, saying she'd feel safer if we had it out. I'm glad she did. Later that night I was still wide awake, watching TV. Katie had somehow managed to fall asleep. From the kitchen I heard the sound of a doorknob being turned. At this point I wasn't even scared, I was just pissed. I flipped on the light in the kitchen and pointed the gun at the kitchen door and there he was. The guy that had been in the house before was standing on the other side of the glass door. He looked shocked and I'm glad we had locked the door. The man unfroze and yet again ran into the woods. I woke up Katie and told her what happened and called the police yet again. When they arrived they did a sweep of the woods and found no one yet again. They told Katie and me that it'd probably be a good idea to stay at somewhere else for the night. Me and Katie said our goodbyes. She was going to stay at her friend's house and I was going home. I left a little after Katie did, and I was on the phone with my brother telling him about what happened. My headlights were on. As I was talking, something caught my eye. That man was standing at the corner of the house just watching me. I gunned it out of there and didn't even bother calling the police again, but I did text Katie and she said she was going to call them again. I don't think Katie ever even went back into the house alone. I had to fly out to a small town I'd never been to in order to look for a place to live. I'm moving there in the fall to start grad school. My boyfriend flew with me, and before the trip I researched all sorts of apartments on Craigslist and set up a bunch of appointments. Now, our first appointment was in the afternoon in this sort of remote residential area. The landlord sent it fine over email and asked me to call him an hour before the appointment to confirm that I was coming. I called, he didn't answer, so my boyfriend and I started walking to the house and just hoped that he would show up. Maybe 10 minutes before the appointment, he called me. Are you coming? He asked. He sounded like an older man and had this very strange, slow way of talking, but I just thought that he was just older. Yes, we're in front of the house now. He got extremely upset. We? Oh yes, my boyfriend's with me. You never told me you had a boyfriend. You never said that. It had never crossed my mind to tell him this information. Since my boyfriend would not be coming to live with me, he was just helping me look for apartments on the trip. I told the man so and after a very long pause he said, I'm sorry, it's just sometimes people don't tell me when they're married and it surprises me, I'll see you soon. Then he hung up. I told my boyfriend about what the man had said and he was immediately weirded out. He wanted to leave but they were slim pickings in terms of real estate at this point so I stupidly said that we had to stay. In case this place was the place. As we're discussing it, we see a man leave the house we're going to view. This man was young and extremely sketchy looking, greasy hair, furtive eyes. He took one look at us and ran out of the house to his car and pulled away from the curb with a screech. Okay, so now we're really weirded out, but this isn't enough for us to bail just yet. And as we look at each other wondering what to do, the landlord arrives. He's in his 50s, very tall and very strong looking. His eyes are completely blank and empty of warmth or emotion. He slowly walks up to us and says, I'd shake your hands but mine are dirty. What from? My boyfriend asked. Work is the flat reply. He asks us a lot of questions about me, completely ignoring my boyfriend. The entire time he stares into my eyes without blinking. What am I going to school for? What other places am I considering for living? Is my boyfriend moving to this town too? I try to give answers that are as vague as possible. Meanwhile, my boyfriend asks the landlord questions of the same kind, which he refuses to answer. Then he says, I propose of nothing. Let me show you the basement. At this point, I should have noped out of there, but I didn't. I kept thinking this was an eccentric old man from a small town, we're city folk and that we were just feeling paranoid. My boyfriend, on the other hand, wanted out of there, but he followed us as the man led us back to the house, away from the street to this sort of detached shed. He opened the door and we saw that there were stairs leading down into the utter darkness. He flipped the switch at the top of the stairs and the light didn't come on. Normally the response for this is, oh, the lights are out, or something like that, but he just said, hmm, and so they walked down into the darkness. Then he stood there without moving in the dark and said, aren't you coming down? There's nothing to see if the light's out, says my boyfriend. The landlord just stands there for a long time, and then slowly walks up the stairs and closes the basement door without saying anything. He took us into the house. Weird and increasingly creepy things ensued. The front door, the only exit to the house, locked automatically. And when my boyfriend tried to fiddle with it, the man got really upset and told him to leave it alone. He managed to get it open secretly though. The man kept trying to box us into small rooms and, according to my boyfriend, kept reaching his hands into his pockets, only to take them away when he caught us looking. On Craigslist and in person, the man claimed that there was a grad student already living in the house. 
but the evidence of that seemed arranged. There were neat piles of generic textbooks on the table, but not other things a 20-something might read. There was a bowl of fruit on the table, but no other food in the fridge or pantry, or utensils. There were maybe three t-shirts in the closet. This supposed grad student wasn't out of town, but the landlord couldn't say what school he went to or how long he'd been renting the house. Finally, the man had showed us every single room in the house but one. This one he refused to open, claiming it was just the attic and we didn't need to see anything up there. He gave us several reasons when we inquired. It was unfinished, there was furniture up there, it would smell bad. This last one I believed, because standing near the door, it smelled terrible. Finally, we made our excuses and bolted out of there. The man walked us out, pretended to go into his car to leave, and when he thought we had turned the corner, slowly sauntered back into the house. My boyfriend, fixated on the idea that there was something wrong with this guy, googled the man that night. We found out three things that he was a pillar of the community, known by a lot of the townspeople, and that there was no evidence of him owning or managing a real estate company, as he claimed on Craigslist, and he had listed his home address as the very house we had been touring, the house where the grad student lived. Yeah, we won't be renting this place. This happened sometime in 2011. I had been married for a little over a year and had given birth to a son a couple months prior. I was 23 and had just started working in a hospital while I took classes to finish my degree and hopefully apply for the police academy. I had met one of the security guards named Joe a few times as I frequently assisted in the ER with various tasks. As I got to know him he had a son a little younger than mine and was a veteran also applying to police academies and we formed a friendship. We exchanged numbers as he offered to help me train and give me pointers for the physical portion of the police test since I was out of shape after having a baby. One day while talking to him I mentioned how where I would study when on break was so loud and wish I could find a quiet place to sit. He offered to give me a tour and show me some all the hidden places employees would use. It was a Sunday so the hospital was quiet and I met up with him. We walked around and he showed me gray areas and offered to show me where the helipad was. We went through areas that were blocked to most staff. As we climbed the stairs and got closer to the roof, I started to get anxious and felt my stomach drop. I couldn't explain it and felt fear as we got closer. I'll admit, I'm afraid of heights and thought maybe that was it, but when we got on the roof, the fear got stronger but it was directed towards Joe. Something was off, and I had this feeling that at any moment he might try something and push me over the edge of the building. I just had to get out of there. Fortunately at that moment, the phone I carried rang and my coworker wanted to know where I was and if I'd be back soon to help her with something. I told him I had to get back and followed him back out making sure he was never behind me. After that day I avoided Joe at work and would only keep text messages short. I felt bad at first thinking I was overreacting because he had never done anything to me to make me feel that way. As time went on though the text became more frequent and he would try to ask me what I was wearing. I told him it was inappropriate as we were both married. I started seeing him more frequently and felt he was everywhere just lingering like he was waiting for me. Finally, one of my co-workers, Stan, asked me about it and I confided in him what was going on. I told him how I was scared to report him because he was part of security. I also mentioned how I would see him sometimes when I would leave at night around midnight and was scared that one night he'd be waiting by my car even though he didn't know what kind I drive. After that, Stan walked to my car every night I worked since we had the same shifts together. After he noticed I was never alone, he stopped bothering me. A few months later, I found out that he was fired for harassing another girl, who had the courage I didn't have to report him. I feel bad that I didn't speak up at the time and someone else had to experience it. So Joe, I hope we never meet again and I hope you never got into a police academy. I grew up in a small town in the Midwest where you left your doors unlocked and came home when the street lights turned on at dusk. After moving away for college, I decided to move back to my quiet, sleepy hometown in one of the two apartment buildings. I'm living there for roughly three months when one night I go to sleep early on a Friday night. Now, I'm a reasonably hard sleeper, so when I wake in the middle of the night to noises, I'm immediately alarmed. I'm going to describe my apartment layout for a better understanding. As you walk in the front door, the kitchen is to the left and the living room is to the right. There's a hallway straight ahead with one bedroom at the end. A bathroom is to the left in the hall and my bedroom to the right. I get up from my bed, walk around the end of my bed, and peek my head out of the bedroom door. I look to the left to see my front door open to the outside hallway. There's a loud voice coming from my enlightened kitchen. From my vantage point, I'm unable to see into my kitchen. I froze. I come to my senses after realizing that I've stopped unconsciously breathing. I take a shallow breath to study my mind and gather my bravery. There's no thought process about what to do at this point. I let my body and my instincts take over. I turn around and head back to the far side of my bed. I grab my phone from the nightstand and quietly remove it from the charger. Luckily my bed frame is high enough for me to squeeze under without much difficulty. I immediately realize that there is no escape from my hiding spot if things turn south. I'll have to rely on luck to get me through this. 
I dial 911 and a woman answers and asks about my emergency. I briefly explain in a whisper that an unknown man is in my apartment and that I am currently safe. I lay there, listening to the chaos of my home, reassured by the presence of my cat, Marcy, laying under the bed with me. It seems to me that he's in a phone call based on the one set of rambling. I tell the operator this fact and explain my fear that he's going to bring other people into my home. He was making enough sound to allow me to give a play-by-play -play on the call. He starts screaming about killing someone. I'm unsure at this point whether he's talking to the person on the phone or if he knows I'm there. The voice is unfamiliar, but this does little to ease my terror. He then starts ringing the doorbell in the outside hallway and yelling for me to come out. My blood runs cold as I realize that he might come try to find me. Marcy is alarmed by the doorbell that hasn't ceased ringing and she creeps out from under the bed. I panic. What if he hurts her? I start whispering as loudly as possible to get her attention without letting him know my location. She senses my unease and crawls back under the bed with me. At this point it's felt like an eternity and I ask the operator how long until the police arrive. She is unsure but assures me that they are on their way. My town is roughly a 30 minute drive to the nearest city police but I assumed there's a highway patrol that would be coming soon. Little did I know that safety was in a rush to get to me. I hear him walking around my apartment and enters my extra bedroom, which is a storage room with a bed. He hasn't stopped yelling. I'm still unaware whether he's on the phone or not. I hear him mention that it must be a kid's room. I shush the operator because he's ceased his screaming for the moment. I hear more noises like he's going through boxes and throwing things. Then my fear is realized, as I hear him quietly enter my room. I see his feet walk closest to my vantage point. He starts going through my clothes and emptying my hamper onto the floor. He turns around and walks to my bed and sits down. I stopped breathing. I think he lays down at this point since the pressure of the bed lessens on top of me. He's deadly silent and I'm still holding my breath. They're shuffling and moving around and he gets up and walks out of my room. I take a shallow breath and steady my conviction. He starts making noise again like he's throwing and punching things. I inform the operator that he was just in my room and the police need to hurry. I don't know how long I can keep Marcy under the bed and concerned about what could happen if he finds me. He walks back into the kids room quietly. I shush the operator again because she is continually asking for a play-by-play. -play. I hear him breathing from the other room. After the quietest few minutes of my life, he yells, Who's there? I freeze again listening for movement, nothing. I'm starting to get lightheaded from my shallow breathing. The silence is deafening, and I fear he's trying to detect me. After a live time, I hear footsteps entering my apartment. I hear a man's voice say, Hey bud, you're in the wrong house. I've never felt more relief in my life before this night or since. I hear my door close, and I crawl from under the bed and break down. The adrenaline and anxiety take over as soon as the feeling of safety washes over me. A female officer comes around to my side of the bed and puts her hands on my shoulders. I'm trying to keep it together and failing miserably. She let me put my clothes on, and I could hear three male voices coming from my apartment. The woman left and came back with a handful of clothes asking if any weren't mine. They all were, and I answered in kind. She shut the door behind her as she left again. I turned and looked out my window and see no lights from the cop car on the street. I look on my phone and realize the call to 911 took 19 minutes. I can't explain the feelings I had at this time since many hit me all at once. The door opened and the officer motioned to have me exit. Taking a first look at my home was almost as anxious as the event itself. My apartment was a complete mess. Clothes were everywhere mixed with garbage and other belongings from my shelves and counters. This man had removed items that he intended on taking and placed them in the outside hallway. They tell me that they found him on the floor in the second room completely naked, holding a bottle of lotion. In his vicinity, there was a winter hat with an unknown substance inside. They tell me to look and see if any of the clothes in the apartment do not belong to me. I tell them no. This man entered my home completely naked and destroyed my home. I noticed that the lid of my garage can was filled with cat poop. It seems that it had been separated from the rest of the bag. The rest of the garbage was littered across the outside hallway. They asked me if I would like to stay here or go elsewhere. They claimed my parents lived on the street and I had an officer drive me there. I explained to my parents what had just happened and in the next few days, I have to explain the situation to what felt like half the town. The ridiculousness of the story catches people's attention and becomes a slight joke. Now I should feel better knowing that he is in custody, but the events after the break-in do little to comfort me. An officer shows up with a subpoena to appear in court to testify, but I receive a call for a postponement. I just want this to be behind me. After a month, I call the phone number on the paper I received and ask when they are rescheduling for since I hadn't heard anything. The woman informs me that they mailed another and I had not shown up. I asked where was it since I have not received a summons. She tells me that they sent it to my address, but the wrong town. It has been two years since this happened and I've since moved three times. I don't know if I'll ever be content and happy anywhere, but I'm hoping that is not the case. He was released six months after his conviction for some reason or another on parole. He immediately disappeared and fled from his parole officer. So naked man, I hope to never meet you again. 
So about six years ago, I was 21 and I was home from college for the summer and living with my parents. This is deep Texas suburbs, so the houses are all cookie cutter houses built around the same time by the same developer. Every few blocks there's a pool or a park of some sort. Well every year, the community people, I honestly don't know how this gets organized or by whom, have a rock the park event at one of the pools slash parks within walking distance of my house. Some old guys bring their garage band and cover songs by Aerosmith and the Eagles, etc. The pool stays open late, there's a playground, and you can hear the music from every corner of the park. It wasn't too loud though, unless you were nice and close. Well, my parents went on a dinner date that night so I decided, with my 21 year old brain, to pour some vodka into my coca cola bottle and walk up to the park for some tunes and have a good time. It's only about a block away from me, so I get there pretty quick and down a good amount of vodka along the way. I'm feeling pretty good by the time I get there, so I head right up to the closest bench, to the stage. They were just standing within some cones and speakers on the grass. There's a person sitting on the far edge of the bench, but I don't really pay attention to him first. There's a good four feet of empty bench between us. It didn't take long, however, for him to strike up a conversation. He had a bony face and looked to be about at least 30. He said hello, how are you, etc. I was polite back, but pulled out my phone so he might get the message that I didn't really want to talk. He asks if I'm having a good time and like a fool, I tell him that of course I am. I'm a couple shots worth of vodka in. I shook my coke bottle at the small amount left and it fizzed. That was when he started to ease his way in. I stayed on the far edge of the bench, but as he kept talking to me, he kept moving closer. He asked if I lived around here and I said, yeah, don't worry, I walked. I honestly thought he was asking because I was not sober enough to drive. He told me he lived in some vague direction and then asked if he could have my number. I started getting uncomfortable because for the first time in my life, I was alone somewhere and in a compromised state. I told him I didn't know him that well and he said something like, okay well, get to know me. I told him I needed to walk around because the music was too loud and I had to make a phone call. I ventured to the other side of this large playground equipment with lots of climbable walls and tubes. I make sure he can't see me, but I know he watched me where I went. I texted a bunch of my friends from college, telling them what was going on and asking for advice. They told me to leave, but I knew he could see me and I didn't want him to follow. I started hitting up my friends from high school, hoping some might be home for the summer already. And luckily one of my friends was. I told her what was happening and asked if she could save me. She said she could, but that she couldn't make it for another 20 to 30 minutes, which was still well before the event ended. I went over to a different part of the playground where the swings were and took a seat where I could see the stage, hoping maybe he'd forget about me and leave me alone. Sure enough, the moment I sit, he's approaching the swings. He takes the one next to me and starts trying to be like, What did you want to know about me? What do you need to know? I was like, actually, I'm getting really tired. I am probably going to go home soon. I just want to enjoy the music a bit longer without talking. That was when he became adamant about walking me home. It was a suggestion at first, but the more I told him no and that I'd be fine, the more aggressive he got about it. My parents wanted to be home for another few hours, so if I did go home and followed, he'd know where I live and have me alone. He asked which direction I lived in and I pointed in the opposite direction of my parents' house. He got up and took a few steps in that direction, then turned back to me like he expected me to follow. I told him that I wasn't ready to go home, but it became very clear that if I was walking home that night, he was coming whether I wanted him to or not. He stayed near me for the next 10 minutes or so until my friend arrived. I saw her car pull up and immediately got to my feet like, hey, that's my friend, and I sped off towards her car. She parked and got out and started heading back towards the park. I was like, no, hey, we gotta go now, but it was too late. He followed me and touched my shoulder. He said, hey, wait, you promised to give me your number. I hadn't, but I felt rather trapped and figured that if I gave him a fake number, he'd be satisfied enough to let me leave. Sure enough, immediately after I spot it off, he calls it and starts looking at my phone, expecting it to ring. That's when my friend goes, hey, didn't your phone die? And I was like, oh yeah, I forgot, I'll get you later, man, text me. And I waved to him and we both sped walked back to her car. He didn't follow, but he watched us drive away. I told her to go to the opposite direction of my house and to take the long way around. So weird guy from the party that wanted to walk me home, let's not meet again. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. I am a 21 year old senior in college, living with three other girls in an old one story house. We are located about a 15 minute walk from main campus and the majority of our neighbors are college students. 
That being said, this town is notorious for being a little, well, sketchy. Millie is home to one of the first insane asylums built in America. After the majority of it being closed down slash abandoned for years, the final building was shut down about a month ago and the remaining patients were released. Now, I doubt this is directly correlated with my creepy experience, but I am not the only one who has interesting encounters with strangers since the release in this town. Two nights ago, after getting off work around 11.30, I came home to my roommates getting ready to go for a night out. I realized now how stupid it was, but we often had an open door policy, free for anyone to come over and visit as they please. We would lock the door at night, but the one time we forgot to really came to bite us. Around midnight, I was hopping in the shower as my roommates were heading out the door. We said our goodbyes and I told them I would be meeting up with them later. I had just stepped out of the shower when I heard what sounded like the front door slamming shut. I automatically assumed one of the girls had forgotten something, so I called out their names, no response. I then hear footsteps in the hallway. I call out again, no response. Fear and dread came over me, and I immediately grabbed my clothes and ran into my bedroom. I threw my clothes on, leaned my ear to the door, and waited in silence to hear if someone was in the house. I hear nothing. I decided that it must have been one of the roommates grabbing something and leaving again. So I head into the living room to get my phone. Six missed calls and it's still ringing. My roommate, Carrie, was on the other end. I answered immediately could hear the panic in her voice. Lay, are you in the house? Me? Yes. Why? Carrie? You need to get out. Sam drove by and he said he saw a man walking through the front door. He called the police but you need to leave. Nothing was going through my head besides pure adrenaline and fear. I wasn't sure of the man's intentions but I sure wasn't going to wait and find out. While remaining on the phone with my roommate, I bolted out the front door and hid behind my car. I watched the house from afar waiting anxiously to see any movement. As my friends approached in a truck, I sprinted out from behind my car and jumped in the back of their truck bed. Just as I did that, a dark figure scurried off into the woods running in the opposite direction. I can only assume he had been inching closer to as I was waiting for them to arrive. I screamed and we floored it out of there. I refused to go back into the house until the police arrived and had been triple checked. There were no signs of anything being touched or stolen, which makes me wonder what the man's intentions were. You can guarantee that I've locked my door every night since, and to the stranger who walked into my house while I was in the shower, let's not meet again. Back when I was 18 years old, I started working at a gas station. This was my first job. Near the end of my first shift, I was cleaning the hot dog rollers and a man walked in. He was rough looking, not in a bad way, but like he had been working outside all day. As soon as I set eyes on him, I got the gut feeling that I needed to stay away from him. Since I wasn't the one at the register, there was no reason for him to talk to me. However, the moment he saw me, he walked over and asked if I was new. I said yes, and he told me I was doing a good job and went on his way to check out. I noticed that he had a Jamaican accent which was weird to hear since I lived in Michigan. Honestly, at that point, I thought that my gut was wrong about him. I was right the first time. During my next shift, he once again came in and again I was cleaning. He came over to me and I still got the bad feeling in my gut. He asked me how my day was and I told him that it was okay. He then looked at my hand, I was wearing my high school class ring and I had put it on my left hand ring finger because I didn't want to scruff it up while cleaning with my right hand. He asked if I was married. I said no and I told him it was my class ring. He then asked if I was dating and I lied and said yes. He started asking me questions about my boyfriend, like how old he was, did I want to marry him, and if we were in a physical relationship. I told him I wasn't comfortable with answering that and he got mad but dropped the conversation. He would continue to ask me questions about my love life every time he would come in. After about a month and a half of this, I noticed that he would come in every day that I was working. This was weird because the days and hours that I worked changed from week to week. I asked my co-workers if he came in when I wasn't here and all of them said no. I also asked if any of them had told him what shifts I had been working but again they said no. This honestly freaked me out and I'd start to feel nervous when I would see his car pull in. One day he tried to give me his phone number and I politely told him that I wasn't interested in it. He got mad and was telling me that I needed to take it. My coworker at this point told him that he needed to leave. The next day he came in and asked me on a date and when I declined he told me that I was going to regret it. He asked me several more times and each time I said no. After a while of him asking I told him that it was never going to happen and that I had absolutely no interest in him and never would. This only made things worse. He told me that I didn't have a choice and that he would be here when I got off work and that I was going to go with him. When he left I called my father and told him what happened and asked if mom and he could come to pick me up at the end of my shift. He said yes. I didn't get off until midnight and about 10 minutes before my dad walked in and told me to act like I was going to go to my car as normal but he was going to be in there. A few minutes after the guy pulled in and got out of his car and was just standing there. As my shift was over I hurriedly walked over to my car. He started approaching me and I jumped into the passenger seat and slammed the door shut. When he got to my door my dad rolled down the window and pointed his gun at him. 
The man ran off and I thought that it was the end of it since he didn't come back into my work the next few days. However, it wasn't. About a week later, I was at the store with my mom when I got the feeling that someone was following us and sure enough, it was him. We got out of there as fast as we could and from then on out, my mom and I were not allowed to leave without my dad. Everywhere I would go, he would show up, even when I went to my friend's house who lived about a half hour from me. We caught him driving by the house several times. My mother also caught him following her several times, which freaked her out. We contacted the police and told them what was going on, but they said there wasn't enough evidence and that there was nothing they were able to do. To this day, I am still mad at the police for not doing anything. He started coming back into my workplace, and I asked my boss to ban him from the store, but she said no. Later, I would find out that they were friends, and that is how he always knew when I was working. I also believe that she was the one to give him my phone number, because it was around this time that I started receiving strange messages about how I looked, about my parents, and other creepy things. I got to the point where I was so paranoid that I wouldn't leave my house without my father. I had to have him drop me off and pick me up from work, and when I was at work any time I had seen a car that even somewhat looked like his, I would run and hide in the back room. Even my poor mother was paranoid and wouldn't go outside without someone with her. Finally, my father had enough and told me to quit my job and that he would help me pay the few bills that I had. Even after quitting my job, I was freaked out and decided to go stay with my aunt and uncle, who was a police officer, who live about 6 hours away from me. When I got there, it was the first time in nearly 6 months that I was able to relax. It didn't last for long. One night, my uncle and I went to pick up a pizza. Less than a minute after he walked in, the glass on my door was broken and hands were grabbing me. It was the Jamaican man and another guy. They got the door open and were pulling me out. I fought them as hard as I could. I got a few good hits on them, but it didn't do much good. Thankfully, my uncle came out and both of them ran after my uncle when he announced who he was and my uncle chased down the Jamaican man after I shot at which man he was. That day, he was arrested. Later on, I found out that he was illegally here and was deported. It took me about two years before I would go anywhere by myself. Honestly, it wasn't until I got my CPO that I was comfortable going places without someone with me. So Jamaican man, let's not meet again. I was in college and I lived in a house with five roommates. I lived on the second floor and the way it was set up is important. There were four bedrooms on the second floor and two bathrooms. Two of the bedrooms each shared a bathroom, which was accessible only by the bedrooms, not the hall. So I could walk through the bathroom into my roommate's room and vice versa. My door had both a handle lock and a deadbolt, which I used every single night because it was a habit I'd had since freshman year. Because in dorms, drunk roommates or floor mates tend to wander in and wreak havoc if you don't. The door to the bathroom, however, didn't have a lock, so I could never secure that. One of my roommates had her boyfriend visiting, and he'd brought a friend with him. I hadn't spoken to the friend or gotten to know him at all, and I didn't really have any opportunities to since I didn't hang out in any of the common areas of the house, and frequently didn't even sleep there because I was casually seeing someone at the time. My first interaction with him was about two days into his visit. I was coming home around 6am from the house of the guy I was seeing, and I walked into the living room. When I came in, the visitor was alone and shirtless in my kitchen, which is open to the living room. He didn't even say hello, he just angrily asked me, where were you, which I was taken aback by, because he sounded like a jealous boyfriend, but I told him I had been at my boyfriend's house and he said, you didn't tell me you had a boyfriend. Well of course I hadn't told him, I've never spoken to him. I made a weird face at him and went upstairs and didn't see him again for the rest of the day. I slept in my own room that same night, deadbolt secure. I woke up at around 7 in the next morning to him entering my room from the bathroom. Before I could say anything, he saw that he woke me up and said, sorry, I was looking for the bathroom. I replied, well, you're standing in it, so, and he retreated and closed the door. I didn't think much of it at the time because I was groggy and I just fell back to sleep. Now, despite all that, up to this point he didn't really creep me out, he just seemed weird. But later that day is when it got worse. I came home from my classes and went up to my room. He followed me and let himself into my room without knocking. The door had been closed, and I made it clear that that wasn't okay but he was being friendly, so we chatted normally for a couple of minutes because I didn't want to be rude. Then he decided to say, I think you're the one. The first moment I saw you, I knew you were the one and you're gonna marry me. Obviously, I was taken aback by this as this was only our third interaction and we'd spoken for maybe two minutes total. I told him that I had no interest in marrying him, that I wasn't even attracted to him, and told him to leave me alone now. I decided to leave and called the guy I was seeing and told him what was going on and he told me I could stay over at his house until this weirdo left. A couple of days go by and the weirdo was supposed to have left for good, so I went back to my house. I slept in my room that night with the door locked as usual. I woke up to hear someone trying to come in through my main door, but thought it was just one of my many roommates. Then, I hear the bathroom door open and someone walking into my room. I rolled over and he was standing maybe a foot away from my bed and said, Hey beautiful, where have you been? I said, weren't you supposed to leave? Why are you in my room? 
He said, I wanted to wait for you to come home. I couldn't leave without saying goodbye. And then he tried to climb into my bed with me and kept touching me while saying, scoot over, I want to say goodbye properly. To which I started yelling, get out of my room. I didn't invite you in, leave now. I smacked his hands away from me and he got upset but left without much of a fight. I immediately left my house and went to my boyfriend's. The guy did finally leave later that morning. The next day, despite me yelling profanities at him and telling him how creepy he was when I last seen him in my bedroom, the guy still decided to find me on Facebook and try to add me. Nope, blocked immediately. So, creepy guy, let's not meet again. This is back in November of 2018 and takes place in North Carolina. I was 14 at the time. My family and I just moved across states. We had just gotten to the city where we planned on living after a long road trip. We were all hungry so decided to go grab dinner before we went to pick up the keys to our new house. We went to this local pizza shop. Since we had our dogs with us, we hadn't moved into our house yet. We decided to eat in the car. I'm a pretty fast eater compared to the rest of my family so I finished way before them. After I was done, I decided to bring my puppy out to do her business. We were standing just a little ways up from the car, playing in the leaves on the ground. I grew up in Florida so I wasn't used to seeing piles of autumn leaves, so it was just living my best life, not paying attention to my surroundings. When a man taps on my shoulder, my dog notices him and immediately tries to jump on him as she does with anyone, so I pull her back while I'm backing away from him. He looks to me in his mid 40s to 50s, he smiles creepily at me like it was forced. He says in his scruffy southern voice, you have my dog, my border collie. Immediately a red flag goes off in my mind, as my dog looks very obviously like a boxer, nothing like a border collie. I just say nervously, I think you're mistaken sir, this is my dog. Not even telling him how my dog does not look anything like he was describing. I look over to my parents car that was just a couple feet ahead of me, unsure of what to do. They hadn't even noticed the men approach me. They were on their phones. The man now asked me, well you would be able to come help me look for my dog, right? I can feel my stomach drop in that moment. I still don't want to make a scene as I'm probably overreacting. He then says something along the lines of, I have some money in my truck for you if I went with him. My hands are sweating at this point. He points over to a very sketchy, run down looking truck. I tell him I'm busy and I have to go, but best of luck to finding his dog. Still trying to keep him on my good side. Looking back on it now, I don't know why I didn't tell him my parents were right there. If I would have, I think he would have backed off. He then decides to grab my dog's leash and says he has dog treats at his truck and starts to walk away with my dog. I pull the leash away from him and say sternly, I have to go now. As I start walking away, he then grabs my wrist and rips the leash out of my hands, throwing it to the ground. He starts pulling me with him, mumbling something like, just come see what I have for you. My dog, the sweet girl she is, follows after us and starts barking. While he starts to drag me with him, I am pretty small 5 foot 4 and have no upper body strength, so I just start screaming to let go of me. My parents are alarmed, hearing me scream and our dog chasing after me barking, see this man pulling their daughter against their will. They immediately start sprinting after me. I start screaming, Mom, Dad. I think he got alarmed when he heard me yell out Mom, as she starts running towards us. The sudden realization that my parents were right there in their car the whole time. He makes a run for it and we didn't run after him. My parents were just glad they had me. This is definitely not a good way to start off our new life in North Carolina, not even have lived there a day yet. I did not wish this to ever happen to anyone, as it was terrifying, but my advice is for you, don't be afraid to use your words, even if they offend the person. I like to begin by describing myself, because I believe it's relevant to the story. I'm 25, male, and a bit above average height. I have been doing sports 5-6 to six times a week since I've graduated high school, gym, running, crossfit, squash, swimming, and any team sport my friends decide to play at any given time. My favorite hobbies are mountaineering, hiking, and bouldering. I've just recently purchased a new pair of high altitude mountaineering boots because it's near the end of the summer season and they were on sale. The plan is to wear them in the Alps next summer on a few ascents. I live in a European capital, one that's surrounded by wonderful nature with many trails and opportunities for hiking. I decided to break in my boots last Saturday, more specifically because it would have been my granddad's birthday and he also loved hiking before he died. These boots are overkill for these woods, but I needed to try them. I selected a nice route that's around 25 kilometers and set off at about 9 in the morning. It rained just the day before, so I expected a fair amount of mud and not so many people as they were easy scared off by the weather. Since the summer was extremely hot, it was a nice change of temperature, especially between trees and such, where it's a few degrees cooler than in the city. In the not so distant past, my dog would have definitely joined me on this hike, but she's turning 14 this year and she doesn't enjoy long distance walks anymore. My girlfriend had to do something for work on short notice, so I knew from the moment I woke up I would be doing the hike alone. 
The first half of the hike was perfect, the altitude difference along the trails minimal, I barely broke a sweat and I misjudged how many people would be out due to the storm the day before. I met at most 6-7 to seven people during the first 2-3 hours and most of them were cross-country runners. It's worth mentioning that I wasn't walking quickly. I stopped on many occasions to take pictures or study some animal tracks. There are deer and wild boars in these woods, nothing more menacing, not animals anyway, but I won't get ahead of myself. Between 12 and 1, the path ran into an actual road, one where cars can go. This road is asphalt, but deep in the forest and can only be used to reach certain landmarks that are also in the forest, so cars seldom go here. My trail required me to take this road for a few hundred meters. As I was walking along the road, I heard a car approach from behind me. It went past me, not too quickly or too slowly. It was an older, green SUV with a fresh registration. You could tell by the license plate. Probably an import. Anyway, I thought nothing of it at the time. Then I heard it come back. It drove me past for the second time, now very slowly, and I could clearly see two men sitting in the front seats, wearing baseball caps and sunglasses. Both had stubble beard game going on as well. I assumed they were gamekeepers, even though their cars have a crest on the hood and on both front doors. As I hike a fair amount, I know these things, I see them around quite a bit. They would also not be driving a car like this, they have jeeps which are more suitable for the forest. Still, I felt no discomfort and again, I thought nothing of it. Then, my trail left the asphalt road and began snaking in the woods again. I walked ahead sincerely, gazing at trees and whatnot. Then, I suddenly had the strange sensation that something or someone was behind me. An engine sound was becoming more and more clear as well. At this point, the trail was quite narrow, but if, for whatever reason, you want to drive a car on it, you could, just about. Now when I turned around, the aforementioned SUV was basically in my face. It was an arm's length away from me, and it stopped just as I had. I looked at the driver, who was staring back, as I can only assume as he was wearing sunglasses. I calmly asked him, what's wrong, shall I let you go, in a polite tone as his window was rolled down. He didn't speak. He slowly started reversing, and he soon disappeared behind a curve. Now I was quite uncomfortable. I also noticed that he was alone in the car, unlike earlier. I listened intently, standing still, since I wasn't sure what was going on. At this point, I was not scared, but there was a faint feeling of unease in the air and bad thoughts began gathering in the back of my mind. I heard the car and the engine stop just behind the curve. I heard a door open and shut, but nothing from that point on. I turned around and began walking towards my destination, at a much faster pace than before. Now I was a bit scared. I didn't understand why he didn't answer, and why he just reversed and left without a word. I wasn't sure what to make of it, and I had no desire to ask him again, or to see him again for that matter. I had just walked enough for these unpleasant thoughts to slowly be erased from my mind. As I had been drinking a lot of water as I usually do, I decided to use the bathroom. I saw a perfect spot, a very narrow path off my trail that led quite clearly to a little hunting tower. I walked over to the tower, put my bag down by the ladder that led up to it and began peeing. I was also interested in checking Google Maps to see where I was, but since there was no signal, I decided to check my map. I also had a sip of water. I had been camping there for a good few minutes before I headed back at the trail from where I deviated to pee. Right before I arrived back to the main trail, I thought to myself how extremely quiet it was. No wind, no noise of any kind, absolutely nothing. This made me realize, just a moment later, how alone I was. Except for the man who was standing maybe 50 meters away from me on the trail, in the direction where I was headed. I only saw this as soon as I stepped back on the trail, since the small one to the tower was well hidden by trees and you couldn't see the main trail, as it was running perpendicularly to the small one. I looked at him and I was instantly chilled to the very bone. He was dressed in tactical clothing, with a baseball hat on his head. The only reason he was standing still, I believe, was a moment of surprise that I had appeared from a place where he didn't expect me to appear from. At this point, I was fully and utterly alarmed. He was holding a rifle that had a scope on it. Had this happened without the incident with the SUV, I would have probably walked along the trail thinking he's a hunter. However, in light of the strange encounter with the SUV from which the second man was missing, something in me snapped instantly. In hindsight, it's also illegal to hunt in these woods this time of year. I figured in the matter of two seconds that I was going to sprint through the woods until exhaustion, towards and past the tower, as it seemed natural to do at the time. If there was no malicious intent on this man's behalf or the others, he'll just think I'm an idiot and forget about me in two minutes. If I'm right, it's the best call I will ever have made. He began running towards me, adrenaline blossoming within me, I began sprinting away. I sprinted past the tower and deep into the bushes, not sparing my legs as I was wearing shorts and a thermal jumper. I crashed through branches, small trees, and slipped on several occasions. I really did sprint until I was exhausted, it must have been several kilometers. I even crossed some smaller trails but didn't even bother to look either way. My pulse was a billion the whole time. I began checking my phone for a signal, but nothing. 
I was already really angry at myself for not memorizing the license plate. After a while I began power walking, but still off trail straight ahead in a direction that I knew would sooner or later lead me out of the woods. When my phone got a signal, I told the story to several people frantically, but no one took me too seriously. They said I was overreacting and whatnot. You must have misunderstood the situation. Finally, I reached a trail that led directly to a cute little town that borders this rather large forest. It felt like an eternity, but I walked the last kilometer to the main square, took off my jumper and put it in my bag. At least I looked a little different from far away. I waited for a bus that took me back to the station near my car, rather anxiously. After the bus ride, during which I studied each car on the road, I walked back to my car, got in and drove home. My dog welcomed me like I was coming back from a two year deployment. Dogs are just amazing, she must have felt that something shook me up. The boots destroyed my feet, but they aren't meant to be sprinted in for long periods of time. I called the forest gameskeeper's office. I inquired about whether they have such cars in service as the one I come across. They do not. Their gamekeepers also don't typically work in pairs, like 99.9% .9 of the time they are alone. I told them my story and they took me a lot more seriously than my friends, but they assured me that the police wouldn't. No one could have been legally hunting in the area during summer either. I've been reading local news but nothing extraordinary has been reported yet. I really hope nothing will be reported either. Gentlemen in the empty forest at lunchtime, let's not meet again. This happened a couple years ago. In 2016, I had just turned 18 and was in my second semester of community college. I was lucky to get to take a few specialized classes that were requirements for my major. These classes required me to drive about 45 minutes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday to the main campus of my community college system. This is relevant because I was going to a town that I didn't know much about and didn't know anyone who lived there. There was a man in my class named Eddie. He was a big guy in his late 40s. We spent a lot of time in the lab for these classes and he was stationed right across from me. I was a bit more naive and unsuspecting at the time and wanted to be nice so I talked with him and my other classmates quite a bit It was a lot friendlier to him than I would be nowadays. He started being overly friendly to me and would stand too close and ask too many personal questions. He'd flirt with me in class to the point it seemed to make other people uncomfortable to watch. He also started staring at me a lot with an intense look that scared me. Of course, being young and not wanting to hurt his feelings, I decided to ignore it as best as I could. I told my boyfriend about it, but again, Eddie hasn't actually done anything to me so there wasn't a lot I felt like I could do. A few weeks after that started, all of us were hanging out in a small break room type area, studying for an exam in our next class, which was about 30 minutes away. I was sitting at one table chatting with some middle aged women in my class, and Eddie was at the next table over messing with his phone. I noticed that I was going to get something from the vending machine and stood up. As I did, he tried and failed to discreetly turn his phone toward me and snapped pictures of me as I walked in the machine, got my drink, and bent over to pick it up. I realized what was going on as I was walking back to my seat with him still taking photos and I shot him a look. He put his phone away and just sat there staring at me. I was trying to look pissed but honestly I was just really freaked out. I excused myself from the table and called my boyfriend near tears telling him what happened. He was angry and said that I need to tell someone but I said no, I didn't want to make a scene. He tried to comfort me as much as he could but I had to go to class soon afterwards. Our last class finished at about 9pm and since it was January, it was completely dark out when we all walked to our cars. I was actually texting one of my guy friends about what had happened when Eddie walked up to my car, stopped for a second and looked at me through my windshield, then slowly kept walking, watching me through my driver's side window the whole time. He was parked nowhere near me and the windshield was below zero so he had to have made a point to walk by my car like that. I was terrified and with my hands shaking I started my car and drove home as fast as I could, calling my boyfriend on the way and crying. After that, I decided I needed to talk to my professor about what was going on. I was so nervous, but I asked her the next week if I could talk to her privately when class was over. We went to her office and I told her about Eddie and what he had done and how he acted weird toward me. She told me that she had noticed tensed up and went quiet when he got close to me, and had noticed paying a lot of attention to me and told me she believed me about the pictures. She was honestly amazing with how she handled it. She promised me that she would move things around where I'd be away from him in the lab and asked if I wanted her to talk to him about it. I said no, that I didn't want to make him angry and she said that she'd respect that, but she was going to have the security guard stand at the door and watch me go to my car every night and that she'd tell the program director what was going on but Eddie wouldn't know that I had talked to her. By the time we had got done it had been around 30 minutes since class had ended and she offered to walk me outside. I'm glad that she did because when we came out the elevator to the first floor, Eddie was sitting there in the foyer alone. Everyone else had gone home. My blood ran cold but I tried to act as normal as I could. He seemed as surprised to see a professor there as she was to see him. She asked why he was still here and he said he noticed my car was still parked out front and wanted to make sure I didn't have to walk out by myself. I'm pretty sure I was as pale as a ghost but my professor gave him a look that I couldn't read and said not to worry. She's walking me to my car from now on and the security guard will be there every night. 
He said that was good and quickly said goodnight and left. It still chills me to think about what could have happened if my professor didn't walk me down to my car that night. I have no idea what he was capable of doing. After this, she rearranged our seating, made sure we were never grouped together, and I started making sure I walked out to my car at the same time as a few other women in my class. The security guard was usually in the foyer and we only had a couple months left of class, so there weren't really any other incidents, but I still caught him staring at me sometimes and he looked like pure rage. It's been a few years, and I don't go to that school anymore, and I'm moving to a completely different city soon. But Eddie, let's not meet again. I recently ran into an old coworker from our time we worked at the sandwich shop in the truck stop. We chatted for a while before he had to leave, but I started thinking about my stint at that place, specifically the creepy sandwich guy. In college, I worked some overnights at the truck stop. It was a pretty safe place in a smaller town, and there had only been three incidents in the four years the place had been open before I got hired in. One trucker got robbed, one group of ladies arrested for, servicing the truckers, and one OD. I was never really worried, even though my coworkers seemed a little concerned that I was a young girl working overnights at a truck stop when there was only one other employee in the whole place. Usually it was really slow, most of the time I'd get 3 or 4 truckers come in within the first hour, a couple people came in with the munchies and ordered 3 dozen cookies one time, but usually it was maybe 1 or 2 people an hour, if that, so I'd spend about 3 hours cleaning ovens, finishing dishes, deep cleaning the lobby, that kind of thing. And then I get to spend whatever time between customers doing homework. The overnight boss on the other side, the gas station side, was cool as long as everything was cleaned and tipped regularly. A few weeks before I inevitably left this place, a guy came in about 20 minutes before my shift was over. So it's about 5am by this point. My coworker had arrived early so he could fill out some paperwork he had to get done. So he was sitting in the back office already. I started making this customer sandwich, making chit chat like usual. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. He told me he was driving from New York to Wisconsin, asked me a little bit about how my night had been. Nothing crazy. I wrapped up his sub, rang it up, and threw in a small discount for him since he seemed nice and I was just happy I was getting ready to go home for a few hours of sleep before I headed to campus. When I went to take his change, things went wrong. He dropped the coins in my hand, but suddenly he had his grip tight around my wrist. The next thing I knew, I'm on the other side of the counter on the floor. He had yanked me across the counter and still had a tight grip around my wrist. Thank god my coworker was there. The manager on the other side had slipped into the bathroom, so to this guy's knowledge I was the only one there at the moment. But my coworker, while filling out his papers, was looking at the cameras and had seen everything. He was out of the back just seconds after I hit the ground, and before I really knew what was going on, he had chased the guy outside. He didn't pursue him far, afraid that someone else was nearby who would come after me. So he ran back inside, locked the door to our side of the store, and shouted to the manager to call the police. The cops came, they searched the area and watched the security videos, but nothing ever came from it. The guy disappeared and I never really heard anything about him. I put in my two weeks notice the following day after my nerves had calmed down. I was switched around so I worked during the day around my classes for my last few days and they made it a policy that two people were to be working both sides of the truck stop on overnights from that point on. I still live about an hour or half away from there, and honestly I haven't went back since my last day just because that memory is still in my mind almost 8 years later. So creepy sub guy, let's not meet again. This took place about 8 years ago. I had been single for a very long time. My kids kept telling me to get back into the swing of things, but I just kept making excuses. My nephew told me about this dating site. He said that there was no harm in talking to people, so I did it. I put everything out there so there were no surprises when or if they met me. I thought that if they still contacted me after reading all I had described myself and we matched, then maybe I would have coffee with them. I met with one gentleman who was way too regimental for my crazy life and kindly declined any more involvement with him. Another guy seemed too pushy and acted like I should be honored to be in his presence, but then there came, we will call him Richard. Now please keep in mind I had very low self esteem at the time. That being said, Richard seemed great. We carried on conversations for hours. He lived an hour and a half away, so all we could really do was talk to each other. We talked about our kids, dreams, goals, my daughter even fronted one of his sons on Facebook. I was a secretary for some self-help meetings in my town and he was going to school to be a counselor. Perfect, right? We talked for at least four months but after a while, I noticed that he kept having small problems come up. Arguments with his mom with whom he was living, no money for gas, his truck broke down, his oldest boy was mad at him, just little things, you know? Not anything that would set me off but it was his poor me to heck with it attitude. I tried to let that go and really be a positive influence in his life. His mother and boys loved me and told me that they had never seen him so happy. Time went on and we were still talking every day. I had an opportunity to come see him and of course, my daughter went with me so she could meet his son in person as well. I took him and his son out to eat at the only little coffee shop in that town. 
He knew I was on a fixed income but I paid anyway because he was going to school and didn't have an income as of yet. We had a good time. We met at his son's house on a hilltop town. We were having such a good time that we didn't notice that the snow was coming down hard and the roads were icing up so my daughter and I stayed the night in one of the rooms. It seemed like the closer we got to his family, the more distant they became to him. It was odd. The next day the roads were clear so we said our goodbyes and went home but before we left I received one extra hug from his son's mother-in-law. She whispered in my ear, don't fall for him. I thought that maybe there was something she didn't like about me. That came out of the left field. The next few days we didn't talk. I thought that was odd. Did I do something wrong? Someone from the self-help meeting told me that there was a man looking for me. She said he looked disheveled and smelled like alcohol. This wasn't a surprise to me because I helped quite a few people get back on their feet and maybe this one fell off the wagon and just needed to talk. As I was driving down my street, I saw a truck in my driveway I didn't recognize at first. It was him. He found out where I lived and was sitting in the front of my house. At first I was happy until I looked in his truck and saw him slumped over reeking of booze. At that point my fixed mood set in and I asked him in for some strong coffee. He told me that he had a blowout with his mother and she kicked him out and his boys won't talk to him. I got him some clean clothes and told him to take a shower. I figured we could sort it out the next day, in the meantime I was taking him to a meeting. He sobered up and agreed to go but the whole time at the meeting my friends were acting like I had lost my mind. Did they see something I was blind of? He went back to my house and he seemed okay, almost 2k like nothing at all happened. My son pulled me aside and told me he didn't like him much but I thought that maybe he was just being overprotective. I should have paid more attention. We went to the store because I wasn't prepared for the extra mouth and I bought 4 2 liters of soda, a gallon of milk, and 2 monsters for both of him and my son, some chips and other things for dinner. After we ate we all watched some TV and headed off to bed. I let him sleep on the spare bed in my room but in the middle of the night he tried to get frisky. At that point no, my grown kids were in the other room and something just didn't sit well with me, like he wasn't the same man he was before. The next morning my daughter came running out of the bathroom angry, she said in a loud voice, someone peed all over the toilet, he didn't say a word. Later we were all eating breakfast and he started to let food drop out of his mouth onto the table and floor and was spitting food while he was talking. He took three two liters and drank them back to back letting some run down his chin. Then, yes there is more, he took the remote and started to set future recordings for his favorite shows and deleting a few of my grandchildren's. He set recordings for weeks in advance. Wait wait wait, what are you doing my friend, this is not cool. I told him but he acted like I said nothing. Then he went to the refrigerator and told me that I had to go to the store and buy more soda and stuff because it was all gone. Like it was gone, he even drank my son's monster and the whole gallon of milk. One day mind you, only one. At this point my daughter was also livid so she contacted his son and he proceeded to tell her that Richard's mother kicked him out because he wouldn't get a job and was stealing money and eating her out of house and home. His other son won't talk to him because he keeps asking for money and won't pay it back. He himself was mad at him for lying to me by telling him that he was going to school when he wasn't and using me as his next big meal ticket. Well that was it. I got all of his stuff together and took it to his truck and asked him to leave. It doesn't end there. He had loosened some bolts on his transmission making it impossible to move. He he begged and pleaded for me to let him stay. He was at that point snot was coming out of his nose. He said that he just wanted to be close to me and if that meant sleeping in his truck he would do that and he couldn't live without me. Well no, I called his oldest son and told him that if they didn't come with a tow truck and get their dad his fate was not going to be nice. They arrived two hours later apologizing for their father's actions. We found out that through his son that for many years he had gone through quite a few unhealthy relationships and took advantage of a lot of women that fell for his lies. He still tries to friend me on Facebook to this day. When I was 16 years old, I decided to surprise my parents with a bouquet of flowers for Valentine's Day. We've always celebrated this as a family holiday rather than a romantic one. I didn't have a car to drive to a florist, but my high school was within walking distance of a hospital boasting a gift shop that sells floral arrangements. Between classes during the week of Valentine's Day, I set off for the hospital by my lonesome, cutting across campus to walk through a network of side roads populated with specialty doctors' offices that kept odd hours. The sort of buildings where traveling doctors mainly hold surgery consultations or perform small procedures a few times a month. The trip there passed without incident. As I was walking back through said deserted roads with a vase of flowers and a tow, I noticed an unkept 1990s car close behind me. While my memory of the car is hazy, I am left with the impression that there were at least two men within whose faces I could not see. Initially, I assumed that the driver was simply afraid of hitting me, the reason they weren't passing by, so I made a point of dramatically trudging further into the grassy shoulder of the road, demonstrating to them that they could drive safely ahead. 
They still refused to pass me by, continuing to creep along behind at a slow pace. Beginning to suspect that the driver was more interested in me than a destination, I began to walk faster. The car confirmed my suspicions by matching my speed. Despite the impracticality of my shoes and the threat of spilling water from my vase, I commenced to run as fast as I possibly could. They hit the gas and again matched my speed. I realized at this point that the car was following me, that there was no one in sight to notice, and I needed to get away. I bolted into the first parking lot that I saw. The car turned in after me. Despite there being only two or three cars in the spacious front parking lot and there being no other set of activity at the office, this car did not stop to park in the numerous spaces available there. The driver instead opted to pursue me in the partially under construction back portion of the slot, behind the office. It passed every available parking space to corner me against a pile of debris and rubble from the construction, coming to a diagonal stop less than three feet away. Before anyone could emerge from the vehicle, I somehow managed to scale the small prominence of rubble against my back. Face in hand, it jumped from its peak to land painfully on the other side, which fortunately was a plot of undeveloped lamp within sight of my high school campus. I took a quick peek back over my shoulder to see if they were still in pursuit, but the car had sped off after it reached the top of the rubble pile and was nowhere in sight. They had not parked in the lot at all. They had no business there. The driver was following me. I sprinted at top speed and didn't stop until I was soaked with sweat in the dead of winter and panting in the student lounge on one of my classmates, who didn't seem to care when I told them. In retrospect, I should have told an adult, alerted campus security, and called the non-emergency line at the local police station, but I was young, foolish, insecure, and afraid of getting in trouble for leaving campus when I didn't have a signed permission from permitting me to do so. I kept trying to convince myself that I had misread the situation or was overreacting. I don't know what I would have even told the police had I called them, as I was entirely ignorant of the subject of cars and I couldn't have identified the make of it if I had been asked, and I couldn't see the faces of the occupants. I was also worried that my parents would restrict my already extremely limited free if they knew I had been in any danger. Whoever followed and tried to trap a 16-year-old girl with flowers at a doctor's office just before Valentine's Day of 2016, let's not meet again. So when I was in probably second or third grade, we had an early dismissal. For those of you who don't know, that's when school goes for longer than half a day but we still get out an hour or so early. I remember sitting silently in class working on math problems when the phone rang. I joked to my friend next to me that I hoped it was for me. We all watched the teacher answer the phone because we knew that 90% of the time it meant someone was leaving class. When the teacher's eyes met with mine, I suddenly got pretty worried. My teacher said something into the phone and then asked me, when are you getting off the bus today? I thought this was really weird. My mom knew I would be getting home because she had to leave work early so she'd be home when I got home. I just told the teacher the normal time. The teacher talked for a few more seconds and then hung up the phone. I asked her what it was about and she told me that my parent just wanted to double check what time I got off the bus. I didn't really think about it too much for the rest of the day. Later I got off the bus and walked home without incident. When I walked in the front door my mom asked me about my dad and took my coat. I remember the look on her face when I asked her, why did you call the school to see what time I was getting off the bus? She looked shocked. She said that she hadn't called the school. I told her the whole story and she immediately started making frantic phone calls. I knew that something was wrong. I watched some TV while my mom talked. About 20 minutes later, my stepdad came home early from work. About 10 minutes after that, a state trooper pulled up. I was pretty scared because I thought that somehow I was in trouble. The state trooper asked me a few questions like, has anyone tried to talk to you while you've walked from the bus stop? Have you seen anyone parked at the bus stop who didn't have a kid get into their car? Has anyone tried giving you a ride? The answer to all of his questions was no. I had never seen anyone suspicious as we lived in a pretty nice neighborhood and it was mostly old retired folk who live around us. My mom asked me to go upstairs to pack my bag as it was my dad's weekend for visitation. When my dad got there to pick me up, he was questioned pretty heavily by the state trooper. I had been eavesdropping from upstairs. My mom called me back down and I left with my dad for the weekend. My dad ended up teaching some basic self-defense, which I thought was pretty cool. I never heard anything about the situation and eventually I forgot about it. Fast forward to today. I was watching a horror movie when I then remembered the whole incident. I asked my mom about it and what she told me chilled me to the core. She told me that someone had called my school posing as my dad. This man knew my dad's full name, my full name, and my mom's full name. He kept saying that my mother wanted him to pick me up from the bus stop because she wasn't going to be able to leave work early. The school didn't even bother calling my mother. I believe that the only thing that saved me from being abducted was the fact that I had told the man that I'd be getting off the bus at the normal time, which was around 3.15. I had actually gotten off the bus at around 1.45. So creepy guy who wanted to abduct me, let's not meet. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. For context, I am a 19 year old girl and was taking summer classes at a community college this summer. One of the classes I took was public speaking, which met Tuesdays and Thursdays. This guy, I don't even know his name, immediately gave off weird vibes. 
To get from our classroom that was on the second floor, he had to go down a hallway, down a stairwell to the first floor, through the main lobby, and out the sliding doors. He started waiting for me after class and followed me all the way down this route to my car. Didn't matter if I pretended to be on the phone, had both earbuds in, kept my head down, literally power walked away from him, gave him bare minimum responses, etc. He would wait for me, follow me slash try to walk with me, and the whole way would be talking to me and asking me questions. Like asking me about each of the cars I drove to the school, since my family has to share cars. Even after I suddenly dropped I had a boyfriend. So he definitely knows my car. I got a very bad feeling after a while of this happening and told the class's professor. She immediately took it seriously, notified camp security, and told me to always stay after class so she could walk me to my car. However, true to form, the guy stopped showing up to class, for at least two weeks or so, so I thought it was fine and that the crisis was averted. And it was, until one day he showed up to class again. As soon as I saw him enter the room, my heart dropped. During this class, I slipped a note to my professor telling her he's the kid in the blue shirt, and she told me to hang around after class. I did, and so did the guy and another female student. Before he tried to talk to the professor about why he should pass the class despite never showing up or doing the work, the professor asked me and the other girl to wait in the hall. From the hall, we could hear him yelling aggressively at the professor. He eventually left and came out into the hallway we were waiting in and pointed at me and said, wait for me. Mind you, I have no idea who this kid is. I instantly got the creeps and rushed back into the room to tell my professor, who was equally creeped out. Having overheard our conversation, the other female student came back into the room approximately 10 minutes later and told me and the professor that the guy was just standing in the hall waiting for me. The professor called campus security multiple times, phoned the front desk multiple times, but she received no responses. So, we took it to our own hands and came up with a plan to leave the classroom together, pretending to be in a very deep conversation with each other, walk past the guy without even looking at him, and walk down the stairwell to the main lobby. His eyes bore into us as we passed him, and we entered the stairwell he stood up and followed us. The professor and I exchanged looks of terror but kept her cool act up, stopping at the main desk in the lobby and pretending to converse with the secretary. The guy passed us, still staring at us, and walked out the sliding doors where he was out of our field of vision. We literally had to track down the campus security ourselves and tell them everything that had happened, and my professor was furious. After we saw security camera footage of him lurking around, she contacted the local police because she and I both had that very strong gut feeling that this kid was not right and that we weren't safe around him. So that public speaking class was from 3 to 5 p.m. and I had another class from 6 to 8 p.m. So I would usually drive to Wawa or something in that hour gap. However, there was no way I was going anywhere because I knew the guy was waiting for me to do so. For over an hour, we, me, the professor, security, and secretary, tried to figure out who this kid was. None of us knew his name because he literally didn't come to class, there weren't photo IDs next to the class roster, and approximately half the original class stopped showing up so we couldn't use process of elimination. All we had was the security footage of him. I was escorted to and from my next class into my car at the end of the night. The security officer asked me to point out my car and when I did he said, oh wow, so he was parked right next to you. Confused, I asked what he meant and he told me that he had been watching more security footage and the guy got into the car parked right next to me, waited in there for a long time, and then eventually left. The thing is, I knew for a fact that I hadn't parked next to anyone when I arrived at the school because the lot was practically empty since it was summer. After finally getting home that night, I was the only person home for a few weeks, go figure. Local police did drive-bys by my home all night in a well check. When I returned to the school two days later for my Thursday classes, I was informed of chilling information. Footage showed him waiting for me in his car on Tuesday after our shared class, which I had already been told, but it also showed him coming back to the parking lot at around 8pm when my last class got out and sitting in his car. I never told him about my schedule or any other classes I was taking. This whole time, my public speaking professor was filing reports, making complaints against the school for their incompetency, and even got a lawyer because she felt so uneasy about the kid that if he showed up again, she would walk out. I was in contact with the president of the entire college, the director of security of the entire college, police, etc. for days. They told me that he was banned from campus and everyone was on watch for him, and that if he was spotted he would be asked to leave until the director of campus security, middle-aged man, called me and told me that he identified the kid and talked to him, via telephone call, mind you. And he told me that the guy, and I quote, just wanted to be my friend, and told me that whatever I was doing with the guy, you know, literally running away from him, probably made him think I was flirting with him. My professors were absolutely furious and excused me from physically attending class for the rest of the semester. I still don't know his name, and I hope I never have to learn it. My new year resolution 2012 was to get in shape again. 
After my first kid was born, I lost my athletic interest, but I had every intention of getting it back. So I started running four days a week with my friend Hannah, who is a great runner slash motivator. We would run after work, five to ten kilometers, usually favoring the forest trail. It's the kind of trail that got lighting in the darker months of the year, so you could run there anytime really. Once you turn on the lights, you got 45 minutes to run the shorter trails, and longer to run the longer ones. Then the lights shut off automatically. We had been running for about 2 months when we started seeing the same man hanging around the parking lot every time we got there. Thin man, 25 to 30 years of age, always dressed in sports clothes but never actually running. He never looked you in the eye either. We speculated that he could be homeless camping nearby because he was constantly there. We got used to seeing him, sitting somewhere close by, silently and always on his own. We felt sorry for him, he never seemed to talk to anyone or interact at all, but there was something about him that made us hesitate to talk to him or ask if he was okay. Can't pinpoint what it was, but something wasn't completely right with him. One evening Hannah didn't make it to our run and I decided to go on my own. I arrived at the parking lot, my car being the only car there. I did some stretching, turned on the lights, and set off on the 5 kilometer trail. I hadn't seen the thin silent man when I started my run, perhaps it was getting too cold to sit there now since it was autumn, dark, and getting closer to the freezing point. He must have been here though, somewhere in the shadows, because when I got to the top of the first steep hill, I could hear heavy breathing somewhere behind me. I look over my shoulder and I see him, he is running like a man obsessed, in regular shoes, not running shoes, with his arms moving in a really strange, stiff manner as he was made of metal. His hands like arrows, straight in an upward inward angle, sort of like a sprinter but more extreme, moving like a robot. He had never done anything to harm me or anyone else as far as I knew, but the look in his eyes alone was enough to let me know that I needed to go. I started running faster, trying to create distance between us and I could hear his heavy breathing getting even more strained. I ran like my life depended on it, adrenaline pumping through my body and giving me new strength. I tore off my necklace and threw it on the ground thinking, I must leave a trace if he takes me, something must be left behind. I tried screaming, hoping someone would be close enough to hear me, but I couldn't scream my lungs out and keep up the phase at the same time. He was still behind me, maybe 100 meters behind now, but I figured that if I trip and fall, or run out of energy, or fumble with the car keys once I reach the parking lot, then I'm screwed. So once I reached the sharp turn on the trail, I went off the trail and ran straight into the dark woods. I ran only a short distance and then I laid down flat on my stomach, my hands searching for a rock to defend myself with if he found me. I realized that I was wearing bright running clothes with reflexes and neon coloring. I had ever felt so visible in the dark before. I could hear him reach the turn and thankfully he kept on running. I started to move slowly and as silently as possible move further into the darkness. My heart sank again as soon as I heard rapid footsteps closing in from the trail. He realized that I must have got off the trail once he saw that there was no sign of me ahead. He stopped and I stopped. I could imagine him listening for any sound and I held my breath and prayed to make him go away. After a while I heard him say something in a language I didn't recognize and walk off. I didn't move. I feared that he would wait for me by the car and realize that I had to get off the trail and onto the main road and stop someone. I couldn't go back to the parking lot. I started to make my way further into the woods, knowing that I would eventually end up on the last part of the long trail and close to the main road. The lights on the trail suddenly shut off. That made me calmer at first, the dark was a comfort and protection, but then, after only a few moments, it switched on again. This could mean that another person had just started their run, and soon I would have someone there to help me, or that he was out looking for me. I decided against waiting to find out, and continued my way towards the main road. It was dark and I fell multiple times, my clothes getting wet from the damp vegetation and I started to get cold. After what felt like a lifetime, I could see the 10 kilometer trail ahead and I knew I was close to the main road. Soon I could hear the traffic. Once I made it to the road, I must have looked like I had been in a terrible accident. Blood from several small cuts from the falling and my clothes dirty. My bright runner shirt soon attracted the attention of a passing car. My waving and desperate shouting made it stop. The driver, a 40-ish man with his two kids in the backseat, spent the next 10 minutes or so trying to make sense of what I tried to say between the sobbing and the crying. He asked if I wanted to lift back to the parking lot and I told him no, please take me home instead. At home, my husband insisted on going to the parking lot to retrieve the car and calling the police. My husband went back for the car. The driver's seat window was smashed and my phone was gone. So was the photo of my daughter that had been hanging from the mirror. I don't know what he was trying to do or why he chased me the way he did, but the look in his eyes, there was no doubt he had bad intentions. So creepy forest trail man, let's never meet again. This is a story from when I was 18, I'm 25 now. My mom and I were regular attendees of her local church. We both attended different midweek groups. I met with some of the younger ones and my mom went to one with some of the middle aged people. Anyway, my mom's group was about half a mile from our house and we didn't own a car so she would often walk there on our own. For the 7.30 start, this was fine in summers because it wasn't getting dark until around 9ish. When her group ended at 10, she would call me and I would start walking slash running to meet her to walk her home. 
We would usually meet not too far away from her group, but we would always stay on the phone until we met. On the night in question, all was usual. She called, I got my trainers on, and locked the house and began jogging to meet her. I usually ran because it was good training for my rugby. In order to meet my mom, I had to cross over local park and go through a dark patch of trees behind some of the local houses. It was usually just before these trees that we met. Anyway, I'm running and my mom's walking. We are talking about her evening and who was there when she suddenly says, Joe, hurry up. I think someone's following me. My heart rate goes through the roof and I start to panic, so I start sprinting still with some way to go until I meet her. I tell her to stay calm and keep her updated on my position. My mom is tough, but short. I hear my mom scream through the phone and also hear it in the distance ahead. Get away from me, what do you want? I don't have any money and you can have my phone if you want. This panicked me. I ran like I had never run before. The distance I had to cover usually took me a good 45 to 60 seconds to run, but I did it so much faster. By now I can see them in the distance. My mom's screams were piercing through me. I could see the guy has her by the hair and is dragging her about. She was fighting him all the way. I shouted get off of my mom and charged in. He was tall and lean but had hardly any weight to him. What happened next is something of a blur and only through me and my mom talking about it have we come to some conclusion on what really happened. And the guy's injuries of course. He saw me and immediately let go of her. She fell to the ground sobbing and tried to run. I caught him fairly easy and took him to the ground hard. My mom says I took him clean off the ground before smashing his head slash shoulder into the ground. He grunted and we rolled but I beat him up. It's at this point that I blank out but apparently I hopped over the guy, headbutted him and repeatedly beat his face. Someone from the houses behind had heard the screams and called the police. One guy from the street was a policeman and had come out to investigate. I remember him dragging me off the guy and it was then that I saw the blood and scratch marks on my arms. He had called me but I hadn't noticed it. The police arrived quickly and we had to be interviewed by them which is all still a bit blurry. Apparently the off duty cop had thought I was the attacker as I suppose anyone would have seen me beat up the guy. The guy was on their records as a thief. He had mugged a girl in town not that long before. When police interviewed him he claimed that he was just robbing her but I'm not sure. He's in prison now thankfully. You never think of bad stuff will happen to the ones you love until it happens. So, guy who attacked my mom, let's not ever meet again. In 2012, I worked at a tanning salon in a strip mall. It was across the street from a Walmart that was always crawling with strange people. The strip mall that my salon was located in was poorly lit at night. There was a sushi restaurant and an auto zone, but other than that, the other stores were vacant. We were open until 10 p.m. while the other two businesses closed around 8 or 9. The salon was never overwhelmingly busy, so there was always only one person working at a time. My best friend also worked at the company, and the salon she worked at was a 15 minute drive from mine. This detail is important later. I'm a night owl, so I worked the 3 to 10 p.m. shift every weeknight. At some point in time, I started getting strange phone calls at 8 p.m. every night. It started off strange, but nothing to be alarmed about. The first time he called went something like this. Caller, hi, I am conducting a survey on women's shopping habits and I figured calling a tanning salon run by women would be a good place to start. We also send out a gift if you participate in our surveys. Okay, caller, do you typically wear jeans, yoga pants, leggings, skirts, shorts, or dresses? Feel free to list which of each you wear. Me, I wear all of those. Caller, great. Now when you wear dresses or skirts, do you ever wear pantyhose? Me, not unless it's winter. Caller, so how many tights or pantyhose do you own? Me, I have no idea, like five. Caller, that is great, so would you be interested in us sending you some free pantyhose? Me, I'm not really interested, I don't wear them enough to care. Caller, okay, totally understand. Would it be okay if I call you for a survey in the future? Me, sure. Caller, when do you typically work? Me, every weeknight. Caller, okay, great, talk soon. I shouldn't have given some random person my work schedule but they were already calling my job so there was no denying this person could find me if they wanted. Honestly, I didn't think anything weird about the call at the time. Later in the month we had a store meeting and the weekend sales associate said she had gotten a few weird calls from a guy breathing heavily and asking her questions. She didn't go into details so I didn't make a connection. The next few times he called me it seemed normal enough. One survey was on skirts and skirt length and brands. The next was about dresses and their links and brands. He kept offering to send me pantyhose though. I kept telling him I don't wear them. He always said, okay, I just want to make sure I am offering them after every call as it is protocol. Then the last survey he called to have me do really scared me. Caller, when you wear dresses and skirts, do you wear panties? Me, yes. Caller, what material are they? Silk, satin, cotton, lace? Me, I'm not really comfortable with this. I think I'm done with the surveys. Caller, come on, I just want to know what you wear under that dress. I'll bring you some panties and nylons right now. Me, no thank you, please do not come here, goodbye. I hung up and freaked out. I called my friend at the other salon and told her about what just happened. She told me the same guy had been calling her location trying to talk to girls about pantyhose and panties too. She said he had even described to one girl what she was doing while she was on the phone with him. 
The salon she worked at had glass front windows with a desk facing toward the window. My salon also had a glass storefront with a desk face the wall. The next few nights were not great. He realized we weren't picking up the calls anymore unless he blocked the number. We had to answer blocked calls because if it was another customer and they complained, we would be in trouble. He started changing up the time of night he called, spoofing numbers, etc. His calls were getting creepier and creepier. Heavy breathing, telling us what we were wearing, saying he was picturing our panties. Really creepy stuff. I was afraid to be at work. I made sure to be on the phone with my friend from the other salon every night for my last hour or so. One day though, the calls just stopped. My salon had a waiting area by the desk when you walked in and then it had a very long hallway with 20 rooms. The last two rooms were the spray tan rooms which needed to be sprayed down each night at close. At the very end of the hallway was a door leading to the dumpsters in the back. To the left of that door was the washer and dryer for used towels and such. This particular night, 20 minutes to close, a weird guy walked in. I had the most intense feeling that this was the creep. I acted normal and asked him his last name. I never been here before. Okay. I explained to him how much a single tan on a regular night cost, like $24. I explained our packages, etc. But I knew my words were falling on deaf ears. He just stared at me with his mouth wide open, breathing heavily. He asked for the most basic bed for 5 minutes. Okay, huge red flag. Why even come in? I put him in the bed and immediately got on the phone with my friend from the other salon. She was the manager at her salon so she decided to close shop early and race over to me just in case I needed her. I had the back door propped open as it was hot in the salon and I wanted to get a cross breeze going while I cleaned the rooms. The dryer was also running which could have impacted my hearing. I was in one of the rooms near the front sweeping when I realized it had been 15 minutes and I hadn't heard this guy walk toward the front door yet. I had hoped he would just leave while I was sweeping up in a room so I wouldn't have to deal with him. So I go down the hall to listen outside the room he was in. The room was empty, he clearly had not used the bed as there were no marks or anything and the glass remained clean. I called out to see if he was still in the salon. Sir, no response. I called my friend so fast. I had a horrible feeling of dread. Where are you? I yelled into the phone. I'm pulling up, relax. Did he leave yet? She asked. I frantically explained to her what happened and told her loudly so he would hear if he was still in the store. Bring your bat. My friend comes in about three minutes later with a steel bat. Together we started going in rooms one by one. When we got to the sixth room, we heard the back door slam shut hard. We ran to it and locked it. We still checked the other rooms, but we both knew what had happened. He had been hiding in one of the empty rooms and bolted when he realized what we were doing. I don't know what the guy's plans were for me that night, but I'm also thankful my friend was there to save me. So, tanning salon perv, let's not meet. About 7 years ago, when I was 17, my parents were out of town for a weekend and left me at home. This is a pretty common occurrence. My parents trusted me. I would usually spend these weekends away staying with friends or family as my parents' house is a bit creepy to be alone in, even during the day. We live in a small rural town where everyone knows each other, and generally it's pretty quiet and pretty safe. Saturday I was supposed to stay with a friend, but her parents decided at the last minute not to let me stay. It wasn't a big deal that I had to leave, I was somewhat prepared to have to go home because her parents got weird about company sometimes. I left her house, which is about 15 minutes away from my parents' house, at around 9.30 or 9.45. While I was on the way home, I got a weird feeling that I can't really explain. I just knew that I didn't want to go stay at my parents alone. I called my brother and asked if I could stay with him. At the time, he was living with a woman who had a small child. He told me it would be quieter and easier for him to just come stay with me, since his dog would bark if I tried to come in the house. He said he would be at our parents' house in 20 minutes. After hanging up, I decided to stop at a gas station and grab a snack before going home so that my brother would be there when I got there. I pulled into the gas station. There were only a few cars in the lot, which is typical because this is a small town in the rural south where everything pretty much stops after 8pm. I parked and walked up to the door. There was a man standing outside the door smoking. He opened the door for me without saying anything. This is normal southern hospitality. I smiled and thanked him. Inside there was another man standing by the door. I noticed him staring at me as soon as I came in. He gave me that gross up and down look and said something to the effect of, Hey, what are you doing alone? Creepy. I just ignored him and walked towards the back of the store. He yelled after me and called me a name. I still ignored him. I figured he was drunk or high or just a jerk. Most people around here talk a big game but rarely back it up. I wasn't scared, just annoyed. I got my snacks and paid at the counter. When I walked back up to the door, both of the men were gone. I was happy to not have to deal with any more catcalling. I began walking across the lot towards my car, which was probably around 100 feet away from my door. As I was walking, I looked down on my phone to see if enough time had passed for my brother to be at my parents. When I looked up, the guy who had hit on me was standing at the pump staring. I looked at him for a second and continued walking. Hey, you know you're supposed to answer a man when he speaks to you, he said. I remember saying something snarky back to him and getting in my car. He looked pissed at my sarcasm. 
I locked my doors as soon as I was in the car, started it, and was thinking of nothing but getting home to eat my snacks and hang out with my brother. I put my car in gear and realized the man had disappeared. I looked around before pulling out of my parking spot only to realize that both men were sitting in a car facing mine across the lot. They were both staring at me and talking, occasionally even pointing toward me. I just stared at them, defiant and pissed. I didn't want them to think they scared me at all. While we were sitting having our staring contest, the man who had opened the door for me smiled and gave me the finger across the throat gesture, as in, you're dead. I rolled my eyes and pulled out the gas station, annoyed. To my dismay, they pulled out behind me. I hadn't been scared up until this point because, as I said, most people here are a lot of talk with no follow through. Instead of going home, I took a few back roads that connect back in a sort of circle to see if they were really following me, which of course they were. When they realized I was testing them, they drove up really close to me and started laying on the horn. I couldn't see their headlights, they were so close. I called my brother and told him what was going on. He told me to come home and he would handle it. I started driving home, the two guys were still in my car blowing the horn. Even with my detours, I was only about 3-4 to four minutes from my parents house. I slowed down to pull in the driveway and was immediately relieved. At the end of my driveway, my brother was standing hands crossed in front of his stomach, clearly holding a pistol. I drove around him into the yard, the two guys actually started to pull in behind me until they saw my brother, then they hightailed it out of there. I have no idea what they would have done if I had stopped somewhere alone or kept driving. I'm thankful my brother was there. This past New Year's Eve, I went away for the night with my two best friends and one of their moms. I was home for the holidays from college, and my friend Sarah invited me to go to Palm Springs to celebrate New Year's with her mom and our friend Rachel. I didn't have any other plans, so I decided to go with them. We went to a cool city about an hour from where we live that is big on shopping and resorts. We planned to have a pretty calm night, watch the ball drop at a block party thing downtown, have a few drinks at a bar. Since we're on the west coast, the ball drop is at 9, so at around 8, we ventured from our hotel, walking to the block party about a mile away. On the way, we passed by a very lively bar. We decided to stop by and spend 15 minutes dancing, but didn't get any drinks. We continue on to the block party, get some dinner, a glass of champagne. The ball dropped and they had a DJ, so we spent about an hour there dancing. After we got tired of it, we decided to head back to the bar and hang out there until midnight. Once we get there, Sarah's mom pays for a drink for each of us, but leaves soon after that because she was tired. It's about 10.30 at this point and Sarah, Rachel, and I are enjoying our drinks and having fun dancing. Rachel tried some of my drink since it was the one she hadn't had before. I went back to the bar to get a second drink and that's the last thing I remember. The rest I've gathered from Sarah and Rachel. Almost immediately after getting my second drink, I asked Rachel to go to the bathroom with me because I wasn't feeling well, even though I was completely fine 10 minutes before. Once in the bathroom, I just collapsed on the floor, and I was almost unresponsive. Rachel not worried, somehow drags my half-lifeless body out to where Sarah was waiting for us. Security, seeing my condition and assuming I was wasted, asked us to leave. Sarah and Rachel decided to take me back to the hotel about a half a mile away. By this point, I was unconscious and there were barely any sounds escaping from my mouth. They saw someone leave the bar at the same time as us, who was walking near us, but they were preoccupied with trying to keep my lifeless body off the ground. At one point, I threw up all over myself, the both of them, and the sidewalk, etc. The next part of the story we had to get from Sarah, and Rachel doesn't have any memory of this. Still struggling to carry me, the man they saw leave the bar approached them. He was hitting on Rachel, trying to get her to go grab a drink with him. She was very agitated and told him to leave. Her friend needed help right now. He didn't take no for an answer and continued to follow us down the street, asking if they wanted to get drinks with him, if he could help carry me and such. A middle-aged woman witnessing this came up and told the man off. Something along the lines of, stop harassing these young women or I'm going to call the police. He left after that. Next, by some miracle, an EMT and his wife that joined the holiday ran into us on the street. He checked me out to make sure something wasn't majorly wrong and then carried me the rest of the way to my hotel and into the room, since my friends could barely hold me up. They thanked him profusely and him and his wife left. This is where Rachel's memory kicks back in. Five minutes later, they get a knock on the door, and it's the EMT and his wife again. They came to let us know that a man followed us to the hotel, and they just saw him pop the gate and start to make his way to our room. My friends called hotel security, but they were unable to find him. My friends didn't get a glimpse of him, but I'm sure it was the same man from earlier. I spent the rest of the night vomiting everything in my body, and dry heaving after that. I woke up the next morning in a pile of pillows and blankets on the bathroom floor. My last memory was at the bar getting a second drink, and my friends filled me in on everything that had happened. Feeling bad, I thought I must have drank way too much, but I had never blacked out before in my life. And the amount of drinks I had, two in two hours, since I didn't get to drink my second at the bar, didn't add up to me being completely unconscious. We decided my first drink had to have been drugged, since Rachel had some of it and had no memory of our walk home, even though she was fully functional. 
I'm sure that man that was talking to Rachel and then followed us back was the one that slipped something in my drink. To this day, I don't really know how it could have been slipped something. I got my drink from the bar and never set it down. My best guess was that it was already in the cup. Thankfully, I had good friends and kind strangers protecting me that night. This happened back when I was in 4th grade. It's always stuck out to me as odd, but when I became an adult, it dawned on me just how dangerous it was. I had been invited to a friend's birthday party, which was to be held at a popular pizza joint that had a bunch of arcade games and stuff. This pizza place was right next door to a small movie theater, and the movie Titanic just had come out, so there was a decent amount of people in this part of the shopping center. My mom had to run some errands to pick up one of my other brothers, so she dropped me off along the way. She said she was going to stay until others arrived for the party, but I knew she had a lot to do. The place was familiar to me and I knew my friends were either already inside or would be there shortly so I just told her to drop me off and I went inside. My mom had also arranged a ride home for me from one of my friend's parents. No one had gotten there yet so I had to look around at the different games and then went outside the restaurant to wait for my friends to show up. There were a bunch of people outside the theater lined up waiting to get inside for the early evening showing of Titanic. That's when I noticed that a couple, a guy and a girl, were standing by a car smoking cigarettes and looking over at me. A chunk of time had passed, probably like 20 minutes, and I was super confused why my friends hadn't showed up yet. I knew for a fact that I was at the right place and that I showed up at the right time. I was going over all the reasons why they might be late when the cigarette smoking couple came over to me and started talking to me. They asked me what or who I was waiting for. Obviously at first, I was hesitant to talk to strangers, but they looked to be my oldest brother's age, late teens, early 20s, so I had been around older people and wasn't too bashful or shy around them, conversationally. I explained to them I was waiting for my friends to show up for my birthday party, but they hadn't showed up yet, and they were all pretty late. The couple made some other small talk. They told me they were wanting to see Titanic, but when they showed up, all the tickets had sold off for the showing they wanted, so they were just going to hang out until the next showing, which they had successfully gotten tickets for. After a little while longer of waiting and talking with this couple, they asked if I was hungry. I said I was, and they offered to buy me pizza. As a hungry kid who was seriously looking forward to pizza, but was unsure if the party was still going to happen, I wasn't about to pass it up. We went inside and ordered and sat down. I ended up hanging out with this couple for a long time. They were being super nice to me, gave me money for the arcade games, bought me as much pizza and soda as I wanted. I had almost completely forgot about my friends and the party that was supposed to happen, until I saw what time it was. Almost two hours had passed, and I started to get pretty nervous slash anxious. I wasn't sure how I was going to get home. I didn't have a cell phone, this was 1997, and neither did my parents. My mom would be furious that A, no one showed up to the party, and B, I didn't seek out help from the restaurant or some kind of security guard or police officer, and C, I'd spend the two last hours with strangers, accepting food and money from them. I decided to ask this couple what I should do. This is where things started to get really strange. The guy turned to me and said flatly, you don't need to go home. Thinking back, I definitely couldn't fully comprehend the weight of what he said. I didn't know what to say, so I kind of shrugged in confusion and said I needed to find a phone. I went up to the counter and asked if I could use their phone, and they let me. I called home, but no one answered. I tried again, still nothing. I then told the people at the counter that I was trying to get picked up, but no one was answering the phone at home. I must have looked pretty panicked, because just then the guy from the couple came over and put his hand on my shoulder and said, don't worry, we'll get this figured out. He then gave me some more money to play a few more arcade games while he figured it out with the guys behind the counter. No idea what they talked about specifically, but I ended up playing another game and then went back to the table we were at. The guy came back over and said that they were going to take me home. He was being super positive and upbeat about it and was insisting that it was no problem whatsoever. His girlfriend was also being very insistent and supportive of the idea. Part of me was super hesitant because I was taught stranger danger and all that, but the other part of me was wanting to believe it was all really innocent and I was really grateful that these people had been so nice to me, fed me, and kept me entertained. They had even missed their movie to stay with me. I said that I wanted to try calling home a few more times. So over the next 15 to 20 minutes, I tried calling home a bunch but there was still no answer. I decided that I would say yes to these people and have them take me home. Again, I was young, impressionable, naive, etc. The people behind the counter must have been seeing this from the more rational side and realized something seriously fishy was going on. One of them had gone on break and called the police to come over and address the situation. Policeman shows up and comes over to figure out what's going on. I don't remember everything about the conversation, but what it ended up coming down to was who was going to take me home. The couple was still really insistent. Thinking about this as an adult, I find it strange that the cop was even considering letting this whole thing to be an option. As an adult, there is no question in my mind that the cops should have shut the conversation down and taken me home, but for some odd reason, they let me decide. I felt like I was being pressured. I remember going back and forth in my mind. These people had been so nice to me and had hung out with me and I didn't want to be rude, and I also felt 
felt really intimidated by the police officer. I remember this part as if it was yesterday. As I was thinking, the cop went over to talk to some of the guys behind the counter, and while he was away, the guy from the couple looked at me with a smile and asked, do you want to go with him or us? I told him I would go with them. Again, in hindsight, I still can't believe the cop let this happen. As we were getting our things to go, the officer did say that he was going to follow us the whole way, which was a redemptive assurance. The officer asked for my address and my parents' names. I got in the couple's car and told them where I lived and we were on our way. The girl was driving and the guy was in the front passenger seat. The entire drive, the guy was looking over his shoulder out the back window, glancing back and forth between me and the cop following behind us. We pulled up to my house and I went up to the front door while both the couple and the cop were parked on the street. Opened the door, went inside and saw that my mom was looking out the window with a very confused and concerned look on her face. She went outside and found out all that had happened and was furious. I didn't tell her the specific things that the couple had said to me. Again, I didn't understand the full gravity of the whole situation until years later. Going through the whole scenario in my head, if the cop hadn't followed us, I more than likely would have been abducted. Thinking about all the things that they had said and done, befriending me and feeding me and giving me money to play games, was them totally trying to come across as disarming and trusting and friendly. A totally screwed up situation that could have been so much worse. Hard to think about. I'm almost 30 now and have kids of my own and thinking about them in this kind of situation makes my blood boil. At about 8pm last night I was walking with a friend of mine, Sally, about a mile to the closest cafe. We're both girls in our early 20s, neither of us own cars, and Sally didn't have her Opal card, which is an automatic ticketing system for public transport. So walking was our only option. It's summer over here so it was still fairly well lit and we were walking down main roads so we weren't too concerned. We finally arrived at this cafe and sit down. I was paying but I only had my credit card and sure enough it was cash only. Sally was on the phone when I got back from the counter so I just gestured for her to stay put and guard the spot while I went to go get cash. This is my home suburb so I know there's no ATMs around and my best bet is a gas station about a block away. I'm doing a light jog so I don't keep Sally waiting and when a balding, sweating guy probably in his late 40s with a tank top and no shoes come pacing behind me as I pass the corner of the block. He walks behind me for about 100 meters. I didn't really think much of it. The gas station was the next building along. It seemed like he had just come out of a nice suburban house along the street and it wasn't the witching hour so I just assumed he was going to the station like me. He didn't even cross my mind as I entered the tiny convenience store, nor did he follow me in. In my peripheral, I saw him walk past the door and out of sight. I looked around for an ATM they sometimes have inside. No such luck, so I go up to this man in his 30s at the desk and reluctantly ask if they're able to do cash out. He smiles and says, of course, and then asks, is he with you? I have no idea who he's talking about at first, and then he points to the man from earlier, pacing around outside the store. Keep in mind, he didn't look at all menacing. He wasn't going back and forth just outside the door. He was drifting in the space outside, from the pavement to the gas pumps to the storefront seemingly aimlessly. I assumed he was on drugs. I tell the clerk no, not thinking much of it at all. He says, oh, he was staring at you before. I thought he might have been your dad. I laugh it off. I honestly wasn't concerned at all. He was still ambling around outside and I couldn't imagine him having a fixed gaze on anything. I thank the clerk for the cash, but before I turn away to leave he says, just wait and see if he leaves first. We wait for a few minutes in silence and the guy begins to pace back and forth directly against the front wall of the store, looking straight ahead and never into the store. It still looked like the man was just on a drug induced amble and seemed harmless. Not once did I catch his gaze, so I figured it would be safe to just slip out the door and walk back to the cafe in the fairly bright light of dusk, especially since Sally was texting me at this point asking, where are you? I thank the guy at the desk once again for his concern and assure him that I don't know the guy and I'm not involved in some weird scheme to rob the store and head for the door. The clerk asks if I want him to walk out with me, I say that I should be alright and begin walking away from the block. As I leave the store, the drifting man stops pacing and makes a beeline for me from the other end of the building. I seriously didn't think much of the guy at all until this point but for the first time he was briskly walking in a straight line towards me. The hairs on the back of my neck stand up and I start power walking so that he doesn't think I'm actively trying to escape him. Still trying to convince myself that I'm just being paranoid and should be more casual. I don't look behind me to see how close he is. I've reached the pavement on the other side of the gas pumps when I heard the clerk run outside. He's yelling at me, go, run, run. I make a break for it, looking over my shoulder. He's grabbed the man by his shoulders from behind. The baldy man isn't even glancing behind him or trying to escape. He's just watching me run away. I keep running until I've crossed the road and then turn around, standing still. 
The clerk is still holding onto the odd staring man. The clerk and I are just looking at each other in bewilderment, not really knowing what to do. He makes a hand gesture to go and I gesture my hands thanks, you know, the clasp her hands together and shake them a bunch of times. I got back to Sally with the cash and bought food before walking back home a different way. Overall, odd guy at the gas station let's not me. Nice gas station attendant who went well out of his way to help my naive self, I'm definitely glad we met. I was selling my old car as I had bought a new one. I posted it on a couple of selling sites on Facebook. I arranged two visits that day and was home alone. It was broad daylight so I assumed everything would be fine. The first one that came made an offer a little lower than what I was looking for so I said I would get back to him later as I had another viewing. The guy from Facebook pulled up in a blacked out Range Rover and three other guys got out. I opened the car and explained why I was selling the car. You know when you just get a bad feeling? I wasn't sure why four people would need to come view an 8 year old car. He asked if he could take the car for a drive. At this point, I was not going to get in the car with him so I said, yeah, take it, I'll wait here with your friends. He asked me to get in the car, what if he just took it? I said, well it wouldn't matter, that's what insurance was for, I was not getting in the car with him. The three guys left and didn't even speak to me, just to themselves and I found that odd but it made me feel very unsure if the car would come back. The car was not putting up a fight for or arguing over, he then pulled back up. He got out and offered the same price as the other guys earlier buying the car for his daughter. He wanted me to get in the car with him to go collect the cash. I said it was fine, his friends could take him if he needed to go but I had another viewing and I would contact him later. I didn't want to walk back to my house as I had now decided to sell to the other guy as they were just giving me the creeps. He then offered more than honestly the car was worth if I went with him now. I said no and locked the car and started walking towards the main street as I had seen my neighbor walking down and shouted to him and his dog. They spoke to each other and drove off. I texted the other guy and told him the car was his and he was welcome to come over anytime to get it. I sorted and filled out the V5 and off he went. That night from my living room the black Range Rover came back and parked outside. I live in a cul-de-sac so I am set back to where we had been. I told my husband and he looked out and he said that was strange and then my phone started blowing up. I politely said the car had gone and that I was sorry but I couldn't help. The car drove off and came back again 30 minutes later. This happened about 3 times that night and was a bit strange but thought nothing more of it as the next few days nothing happened. On the Friday 4 days later I finished work early and get back and get the dog ready to go out. We were going to head straight to the park and run like the wind. As I got to the end of the cul-de-sac the same car pulled up and one of the guys jumped out and said hello. I held the lead tighter and my dog was thoroughly unimpressed. She gave a bit of a grumble and he asked if he could pet her. I said no she is a guard dog and doesn't like to be touched and went to walk up to me. He then grabbed my arm and the dog latched into his forearm. He was screaming there was only one other guy with him in the car and he jumped out and started to shout. This is the most placid and loving dog you will ever see and to be honest it was a warning nip as if she had meant to really hurt him she would have gone through the bone. His friend was shouting and pulling him away. I called her back and got her to sit with a few neighbors and came out when they went towards their car. I haven't seen their car since but honestly I wouldn't sell something that meant someone had to come to my home online again. So a stranger who clearly wasn't interested in the car, let's never meet again. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. When I was 11, we, my single mom, 9 year old sister, and 6 year old brother moved into a beautiful, older, craftsman style house. I heard it was around 80 years old back then in 1994. Soon after we moved in, we found out it was infested with cockroaches. I never seen anything like it. We turn on the lights at night and they'd scatter from every surface. We had to store all of our food that wasn't canned in the fridge so they wouldn't get into it. We tried bug bombs and professional exterminators numerous times with no effect. Those things really can survive a nuclear war. Anyway, they weren't the reason we lived in the house less than a year before fleeing for our lives. I remember my mom discussing at our next door neighbor's creepy son with my grandma. He was in his 20s or 30s. She'd been doing dishes one day and looked up to see him standing directly on the other side of the kitchen window, staring in at her. Normally, she would have kept something scary like this from us kids, but about at that time, she told us to tell her if we ever saw him near the house and we weren't allowed to play outside. So one afternoon we were all doing some spring cleaning when my brother said he found a cigarette butt in the upstairs toilet. Weird since nobody in our family smokes. Being a dumb little six year old he flushed it before telling our mom. I still remember her trying to get the entire story out of him being upset that the evidence was gone and thinking he might have been mistaken or maybe he'd picked up a butt somewhere outside of curiosity. She soon dropped it and we mostly forgot about it. I think it was a few weeks later. My brother was spending the night at our grandparents and my sister and I were the only ones upstairs. Our mom's bedroom was downstairs. My sister heard a sound like a screen door slamming, but she insisted it came from in the house and she was freaked out. I told her it was just from outside and to go to sleep. 
A minute later, we heard a strangled cough coming from just outside our bedroom door, a man's cough, and sounded like he was trying to keep from making noise. I whispered that we needed to get downstairs. We sneaked out of the room and I had the irrational urge to turn on the light in the bathroom, which was just across the hall from our bedroom, and check to see if anyone was there. Then just as strong of a feeling to get away from the bathroom and get downstairs now. The scariest moment of my life was when we were creeping down the stairs in the pitch black. It was a spiral enclosed stairway with walls, the perfect place for someone to hide. The stairway light was burned out and the wood steps were creaky, so it was terrifying making our way down. We got downstairs and woke up our mom, panicked that there was a guy upstairs in our bathroom. She started to tell us to go back to bed, but could see we were seriously scared. She went over to the bottom of the stairway to go up and shows that there was nothing to be scared about. Then she just has strong of a feeling to close the stairway door and lock it now. She did, called the cops, they found nothing and didn't really take us seriously. The next day, she called a PD detective friend of hers from high school to come over and inspect the house. Remembering the cigarette butt in the toilet, she had him look at the upstairs bathroom window. It was a high, narrow rectangular window. Not very big, but just wide enough for a person. Who knows how many times the intruder climbed our roof to get in and was upstairs while we were sleeping across the hall. The window swung up on hinges. When my mom's friend let the window drop, it sounded like a screen door slamming. He said the locks on all the windows were so old they were practically useless, and we needed to get out of the house immediately. We moved into my grandparents' house that day. When my mom went with her brothers a few days later to pack up some things, a back door had been smashed open, but nothing in the house was disturbed. A few years later, we heard the neighbor's son was arrested for attempted murder. I still wonder what might have happened if I turned on that bathroom light, if my mom didn't lock the stairway door, or if we didn't leave the house when we did. Backstory, my wife and I don't live together. She had become abusive over the last few months, mostly towards our daughter. Our daughter is almost 18 months old and is my whole world. I am unemployed at the moment, but my mother had been helping me out a lot. Today at around 4 p.m., I took my daughter to the store. I usually do this around the time she wakes up from her nap. My daughter is a very active child and can't seem to sit still for more than 10 minutes without getting cranky. I usually let her walk with me, holding her hand and patiently walking at her pace. I usually get just a juice for her, but had to get some extra groceries that I was short on. Flour, sugar, and some noodles. I also remembered we were low on milk and grabbed a gallon on our way back. With all that I was carrying, I wasn't able to hold her hand. I made sure to walk behind her, but that only makes her walk slowly. As we made our way to the registers, I was continuously urging her to keep walking, which she would do, but only for a second before her attention would be drawn to another rickety box with whatever was on sale, or she would see something colorful on a lower shelf. I was getting a bit frustrated, but I wasn't showing it in my voice. I kept urging her to keep walking and she kept getting sidetracked. With everything I was carrying, I started to wish I had grabbed a basket. At the front, their customer service desk holds register 1, which was thankfully open. I want to take the time to mention that my daughter is very fond of saying hi and waving at everyone. I set everything up to get rung up, but the service attendant was busy with the return of the customer service area, so I had to wait. The entrance to the store is to my right, the only exit door is behind the service desk, which leads into the small foyer before leading to the other doors. As people enter, they have to pass the customer service desk. I was being fatherly to my daughter, trying to entertain her with patty cake and the itsy bitsy spider, while we waited for the cashier to check us out. My daughter would frequently wave at people passing and say hi in her squeaky toddler voice. Some people would smile and wave back, while others would stop to adore her. At this point, I'm used to people doing that. The lady was ready to check us out, and I told my daughter to hold my hand, since I wouldn't be looking her way. I had to pull my wallet out to retrieve my debit card to pay for the groceries and let her hand go for a moment. I kept looking her way to make sure she wasn't wandering off. The lady went to hand me my receipt when she all of a sudden yelled at someone behind me. What are you doing with this daughter? She bellowed as I turned to look at a man who had picked her up and started running towards the entrance doors. I was shocked. The doors didn't open since they were a one-way set of doors, and the cashier quickly picked up the phone yelling that she was calling the police. I was stunned to the point of immobilization, but quickly realized what was going on. I have a pocket knife that I usually carry on me so I can break the seal on my daughter's juice. I quickly ran after the man as someone started to make their way through the entrance doors. He didn't get a chance to run through though because I slammed my fist across his temple. I decided to not use the knife in case I might get in trouble. The man stumbled and I grabbed my daughter from his arms. He then proceeded to run out the door empty handed. The police arrived about 5 minutes later and asked me what I had seen. I explained that I hadn't seen the man's face since he had long hair and a beard. He was also wearing a hoodie, which wasn't that much of a surprise. 
They took the statement of several witnesses, including the cashiers, and had already had other officers searching the area. Someone had said the guy had ran behind the building, but the officers didn't find anyone. The police took us home and then asked more questions like, have you seen him before? Do you know anyone who looks like this man? And they proceeded to ask about the home life. CPS had been over earlier in the day to discuss my wife's mental health plan, and the police had been here earlier as well. The officers asked if we needed any groceries or anything. I told them no. The officers left, leaving me their cards in case I saw the guy around the area. About 20 minutes later, I got a knock at the door. To my surprise, the officers had returned with the largest box of Pampers diapers I had ever seen. A large box of wipes, about six large Winko bags of groceries, and a couple bag of toys. They had left us with a Christmas card saying I was a strong father to have had so much go on recently and that my daughter was lucky to have such a great father. There was a $100 bill in the card too, wrapped in a note that said to get a drink or two if I needed it. I don't drink so I'll probably get some extra Christmas presents for my mom and daughter. So, to the guy that tried to kidnap my daughter, I hope the police find you. Close to 10 years ago, my best friend and I scored the deal of the century. Liv and her parents recently purchased and refurbished home for cheap as Chip's rent so the property wasn't considered unoccupied and their insurance still covers it. They were planning on selling their house in the country and moving closer to town in a year. But when they spotted this place, it was perfect so they snapped it up. They couldn't be bothered dealing with random tenants for a year so we offered it. It was a lovely old mid-Victorian style house with a hallway running the majority of the link on the left side, and three bedrooms and a bathroom coming off the hallway to the right. At the back of the house was an open plan living room and kitchen in a backyard. It was an inner Melbourneian suburb, so it was totally fenced in with six foot fence on three sides, and the front had a cutesy white picket fence. On the right side of the property, an outdoor gravel pathway was wedged beside the bedroom walls and the fence line. It began with a gate in the front yard and ran the length of the property to the backyard. This is important later. My friend obviously scored the master bedroom at the front, with lovely vertically opening bay windows facing the front garden and street. I had the next bedroom, with the window facing the gravel path slash fence, and the third bedroom was our study. We lived here for close to 10 months in bliss, great house, great company, and even though the area was considered a little dicey, the location was stellar. One hot summer night, we said our goodnights, and I went to bed and fell asleep immediately. My housemate stayed up in bed to read for a bit, with just her bedside light on. She was doing that just for an over an hour before she heard a weird scratch in the front window of her bedroom. Initially, she put it down to an overhanging tree branch, till she realized there was no overhanging tree branch. She sat frozen in fear, blankly staring at her book for what felt like an eternity, till she heard the noise again and again, scratch, scratch. Slowly looking up, she saw a dude wearing a hoodie trying to open her window, looking her dead in the eyes. She screamed, jumped out of bed, and ran straight into my room. I woke up super dazed as she was pulling my hand and whispered yelling that someone was trying to break in. She had a tendency to be a little overdramatic sometimes, but I swear I've never seen someone look so genuinely terrified. I went to grab my phone to call the cops, but we just went completely still when we heard the distinct crunch 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 of someone walking down the side path of the house. We both rolled off my bed onto the floor and went completely still. The crunch 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 continued, getting closer to my bedroom window. I don't know what it is about distinct sounds at night when it's otherwise quiet, but it sounded deafening. And then I realized why it was so loud. My window was wide open. I jumped up, slid the window down, and slammed the lock shut just as he reached the window. He looked at me, but he didn't react at all. He just calmly tried to open the window, but when he realized he couldn't, he continued down the pathway to the backyard. I was extremely terrified now and my housemate was crying. I sprinted to the back door to thankfully find it locked and ran back to my room and called the cops. I didn't know what the cops knew that we didn't, but they must have broken a land speed record to arrive all at 3 minutes later, lights and sirens off. We saw them go down the side path, guns drawn, straight to the backyard. There were some noises from the yard, then a knock at the back door a moment later and the police identified themselves. Turns out the dude had vaulted the back fence, and another patrol car was headed to the next street over to look for him. The two cops at our place asked if we were okay and then asked if they could come in and look around. They managed to calm us down whilst making sure the place was safe. They took her statements and they asked if there was anyone we could stay with tonight. My housemate and I stayed at our boyfriend's place for a few nights after that, and when we stayed in the house, it was never the same. We felt completely violated, and ended up moving out a few weeks later. We never found out if the dude was caught, but there was a random stabbing a few nights after the incident at the train station two streets over. If it was related or not, I don't know, but all I can think is that we were so lucky that it went the way it did. This happened way back in October of 2006. At the time, I was just a 19-year-old kid always on the lookout for adventure. One Friday night after wrapping up a shift at McDonald's, I met up with some of my friends who suggested we check out this haunted location called Whitesbridge. 
My one buddy Brendan said he had recently learned about it and began telling us the legends associated with the 100 year old wood covered bridge. Everyone had turned down a spooky experience. We all piled into my green Ford Taurus and headed out on our journey. Brandon gave directions, guiding me off the main road and within minutes we were on the dirt back roads, surrounded by woods and cornfields. Our only point of reference was a blinking cell tower off in the distance. We could tell we were getting further from the city as our cell phones began slowly losing service. As we rode deeper and deeper into what legitimately felt like the absolute middle of nowhere, Brandon repeated the legend associated with the bridge. Back in the early 1900s, a local farmer discovered that his beloved wife had been cheating on him, and in a fit of rage he killed her and her lover after discovering them in the act. After committing the cold-blooded murder, the farmer left his home and wandered the dirt roads into days. He eventually came upon White's Bridge where the realization of what he had done finally began to sink in, and deciding he would rather die than face the consequences of his actions, he hoisted a rope up and over one of the bridge's rafters and hung himself. As far as I could tell now, the story is complete fiction, but we totally believed it at the time. After a long and bumpy ride, Brandon instructed me to turn right on an off-road I wouldn't have even noticed was there had he not pointed it out. I took the turn and there before us was White's Bridge. It looked like something straight out of a horror film, an old wood covered bridge, aged by time, sitting alone above a river deep in the middle of nowhere. We parked the car on the side of the road and got out to explore. Immediately catching our eyes was a scarecrow line abandoned at the entrance to the bridge. My friend Mike, who was known as somewhat of a risk taker, and a stupid one at that, picked up the scarecrow and lit it on fire. The hay body burst up into a ball of flames and Mike waved it around proudly next to the old dry wood bridge. Realizing the risk, I told him to throw the thing in the river and put it out, which thankfully he did. After making sure there weren't any rogue embers that could ignite the bridge, Brandon suggested we get back in the car and pull it onto the bridge. He explained that the legend was that if you parked your car in the middle of the bridge, put it in neutral and killed the engine, the spirit of the dead farmer would push the vehicle forward to get it off the bridge. Naturally, we had to try this. We piled back in and did exactly as he said. We parked halfway across the rickety old bridge and killed the engine. We sat in the pitch black, saying nothing, waiting for something, anything to happen. The only sounds were the creaking of the bridge, the river flowing beneath us, and footsteps. Suddenly, the back driver's side door opens and a woman abruptly enters the back seat, cramming in next to my two friends back there. She looked to be in her late 20s slash early 30s, long straight black hair, slim, and wearing a plaid shirt and blue jeans. It's been a while but this is essentially how I remember the conversation going. I saw your fire signal for me, she said. Uh, wait, what? I replied, totally freaked out and at a complete loss of words. I'm so glad you came. My boyfriend's car broke down down that way. I need a ride back. My brain was doing its best to compute the situation. I'm sorry, but who are you? I asked. What are you doing out here? I told you. She responded curtly. My boyfriend's car broke down over there. Can you please just give me a ride so I don't have to walk all the way back? She was pointing ahead, towards a narrow road that forked off to the right on the other side of the bridge. My friend Mike, the scarecrow burner, and ever the gentleman added, I mean, if you need a place to stay, you're more than welcome to come crash at my place. I got plenty to drink and I interrupted them. No, lady, listen, I'm sorry. I don't know who you are. You just got in my car and this is all really weird. I'm sorry, but you have to get out. She glared at me in the rearview mirror. If if looks could kill I would have been done for, but you signaled for me. She responded in an irritated tone. We weren't signaling for you, get out. She let out an angry sigh and got out, walking back in the direction from which she came and disappearing into the night. I started the engine right up and looked at my friends. They all had looks of disbelief on their face. Without saying a word I put the car in drive and slowly rolled forward and off the bridge. We needed to turn around and go back across the bridge to get to where we had come from, and the only way to do that was to pull onto the side road that the woman said her boyfriend's car had broken down on, and then reverse. As I pulled onto the side road, my headlights illuminated the three posted signs that I hadn't been able to see from the bridge. No trespassing, private property, and do not enter. Looking up the road, there was no sign of the woman. Wherever she went, it didn't appear she went that way. I didn't want to stick around though, so I backed up and crossed the bridge again, and from there began the journey home. We didn't have much to say on the ride home, I think we were all equally stunned. Except for Mike, who asked if he knew anyone that would be awake at this hour that he could score some weed from. I visited White's Bridge a couple other times after that, but nothing of no happened in my subsequent visits. Sadly, some people burned down the old White's Bridge some years ago. It was rebuilt, but from what I hear, it's just not the same as the original. I don't have any plans to go and check it out. To the strange lady who entered my car out in the middle of nowhere at 2am, let's not meet. This happened in 2019. I was in my second year of college and living in a town home about a 10 minute walk from campus. I lived with two other girls at the time, but they were all back at their parents' house for the holiday. I work in healthcare and was working Christmas this year. 
A little bit of backstory, there used to be four of us living there but one girl had moved out due to issues with her boyfriend. He was a jerk who abused our kindness and allowing him to stay there, was only supposed to come every so often but basically ended up living there. We told her she needed to kick him out after an incident with him one night after he got physical with her and verbally abusive with the rest of us. She wouldn't listen and we told her we would have to talk to the landlord then. Long story short, she ended up moving out and left on bad terms with us. At this point, it was affecting everyone and we didn't feel safe with him there, etc., so she moved out. Okay, so back to the story. It was Christmas Eve and I worked the next day, so I was getting ready for bed. Locked the doors, turned the lights off, and went downstairs where my bedroom is. I was scrolling on my phone for about an hour. It was Christmas Day at this point, when I heard what sounded like the chairs in the kitchen move. The kitchen is right above my bedroom. I thought maybe I was hearing the neighbors next door as we share the same walls and sometimes they can be loud. But I remembered one of them texting me and asking me to bring in a package they were expecting while they were all gone at home. The noise was short lived so I brushed it off. Next thing I know, my bedroom door is being opened slowly, but my phone screen is lighting up my scared jaw drop face, so I can't act like I'm asleep. Where I'm laying in bed faces directly to the door, so we're just looking right at each other. So there I was laying in my bed while this guy has one foot in my bedroom with the door cracked open. It felt like an eternity, but in reality it was probably more than like 10 seconds of us looking at one another. He slowly takes his foot out and closes my door. I sit there just in complete utter shock. I couldn't make out what he looked like as my eyes were adjusting to the dark again from the phone screen. All I could see was a backwards baseball cap. I knew I had to call the police but my anxious self knew if I called, it would alert my parents phones that I called. Me being dumb I was like well I don't want to make them worry. Also I was scared he might still be somewhere in the house and I didn't know what he would do if he heard me call. So I text the guy I was seeing at the time and tell him, some random guy just broke into my house and came into my room. He snaps me out of it and told me to call the police and so I did. The dispatcher asked me if I felt comfortable to go unlock the front door for them so they didn't have to break it down and I told her no way I don't care if the door is broken I'm not going up there alone. A couple minutes later I see flashlights shining through my window. I hear the police knocking at the door and announcing themselves. They got in and asked me where I was. I came out of my room and they came and got me. They told me to wait on the back porch while two of them searched the house and one stayed with me. They didn't find anyone and I said nothing looked like it had been taken. They even tried to get fingerprints but were unsuccessful. They then started asking me questions and informed me that the back door was unlocked and had no signs it had been broken. I told them I had locked it. Luckily the guy I was talking to stayed with me that night but I still couldn't sleep. I kept having to go check every inch of the house over and over. I placed chairs under the door handles on the front door, back door, and my bedroom. The next day I informed our landlord and she refused to come out and change the locks, and she never ended up changing them for the rest of the time we lived there. Every time I go to bed now, I triple check all the doors have been locked, doesn't matter where I am. I have a dog now and he helps my anxiety of intruders, as well as a recent purchase of a ring doorbell. I believe it was our old roommate's boyfriend. I think they may have made an extra key for him because he was basically living there, but I don't understand why he didn't do anything to me, the house, or our belongings. If it were someone random, I don't know why they wouldn't have done what they intended and that could be many different possibilities. I don't know what their intentions were that night, but to the man who broke into my house on Christmas Eve, let's not meet again. Over the summer, me, my fiance, and my stepdaughter, then two years old, went on a vacation to Presque Isle in Pennsylvania. We stayed there throughout the afternoon and decided to get dinner in a nearby town, Erie, Pennsylvania. We go there and see a water fountain that kids play in. We think our kid would like that, so we get food and take her there. Now, it was kind of a pretty sketchy area, but there were also kids and it was still a little light out, like 6.30, 7pm-ish. Me and my fiance sit down and watch our kid play for a bit. At some points, every kid wants me to run in the water with her, so I do. I kind of keep going back and forth between playing with her and keeping my fiance company. After playing with my kid for a while, I come back to my fiance. She looked kind of pale and said, go get our kid, we need to leave right now. I didn't know what was going on, but I got my kid. As I was turning to go back and get her, I noticed a group of about three really weird guys staring intently at us. When I looked over, one of them stood up a little bit and was giving me a stare. I grab up her kid and start following my fiance who was booking it. As we were walking away, she tells me that somebody is following us now. I look over and see the creepy looking, shirtless dude getting into his old, beige sedan behind us. My fiance explains to me that the same man kept approaching her whenever I would get up to run around with her kid. At first he introduced himself and tried talking to her. She thought he was being benign but just trying to hit on her. 
When I came back, he apparently bolted. I sat with her for a couple of minutes and then went back to play with our kid. Apparently, as soon as I went, he returned. He asked her if she was married to me. She said that we were going to be hoping that it was the end of that. He goes away before I came back to sit with her again. The third and final time I go to play with our kid, he apparently came back. He told her that she thought she was a beautiful lady and asked if that was her daughter, pointing to our kid. My fiance said yes and the guy said that our kid was also a beautiful lady and that his night was going to be made, whatever that means. Q and I come in and we book it. We're walking back to our car which is kind of far away. Erie in general was pretty abandoned outside of the park and we notice the car pull out and start driving extremely slowly in a street parallel to us. At this point, I don't think he knew we saw him. My fiance is freaking out and I tell her to wait near the vestibule of a closed Starbucks where we weren't in this guy's vision. We stayed there for about 5 minutes and I was watching the roads, not seeing anything. We continue walking but are still on high alert. I found my car parked outside of a McDonald's and we're now power walking to it holding our kid. I look behind and lo and behold the same beige car going at 3 miles per hour just barely inches out from the side street so I can see it. As my fiance and the kid are getting in, I turn around and stand at the back of the car and shoot this guy the death stare. After looking at his car for about 10 seconds solid, he peels out and speeds off past us nearly hitting me. Not sure what this guy's problem was, I assume that he wasn't tailing us for any good reason. Afterwards, I bring up the three guys that were staring at me. My fiance said that the pervert following us was sitting with them when he wasn't coming over to her and saying creepy stuff. During college, I dated a fairly well-known and talented local musician named Tim. In the beginning, he was a loving, attentive, charismatic, seemingly normal partner. He made me mixtapes, cooked me my favorite meals, and dedicated songs to me at open mics around town. However, over the course of our year-long relationship, his mental health severely declined. He had the ability to appear lucid and normal around other people, but in private he began suffering delusions, compulsively lying, and creating art that focused on themes of murder. I was worried sick and his condition was exhausting, but I did my best to be kind, understanding, and supportive. I loved him and believed that he shouldn't have to struggle with his mental illness alone. One time he vanished without a trace for a full day. I found his apartment empty, lights on, front door wide open, phone on his nightstand. I took a few deep breaths and called all around the city for hours before finally discovering he had been involuntarily checked into a mental hospital. I did my best to be strong for him, seeing him every day during supervised visitation hour, bringing him his favorite books to pass the time, and holding him as he sobbed that it was all a mistake, that he did not belong there. It was surreal to see my boyfriend surrounded by visibly insane long-term psych ward patients. In retrospect, none of the staff ever told me the real reason why he was there, and I was too polite and naive to ask. Our relationship ended a few months later. I found undeniable evidence that he was cheating on me and, secretly relieved, confronted him. I told him to leave my apartment and never come back. He cracked. The gentle Tim I had known and loved melted away to reveal a new dark persona. He threatened to off himself with pills unless I took him back, but I was so extremely done that I called the police. They weren't much help, but Tim left. I blocked him everywhere and never contacted him again, but he left me insane voicemails from different numbers for weeks afterwards. I was relatively unshaken and things returned to normalcy. I graduated and got a sweet job in the same cool college city. Six months later, I woke up to concerned texts from mutual friends saying that they didn't want to freak me out, but Tim was off his meds, clearly manic, and was posting a newly written song all over his social media. His best friend, who hadn't been in touch since before the breakup, sent me an apology along with a screenshot of the lyrics. That got my attention. The song was pretty explicitly about my murder, but in a sort of clever, disguised way. I checked his profiles myself from a friend's account and he was posting dozens and dozens of totally insane rambling statuses, most of them about me. They flip-flopped between flowery love prose and murder imagery. His friends were reacting with concern but a few egged him on, probably thinking he was just venting about his ex. I decided it'd be best to continue ignoring him, but I saved screenshots just in case. A few days later, while at work, I looked up from my computer to see Tim enter into the far side of the studio. My blood turned to ice. He was talking to my creative director. It looked cordial enough, and I saw Tim begin to casually scan the studio. I ducked down and bolted into my favorite project manager's office, slammed the door, and unleashed upon her what it must have been a nearly unintelligible explanation of what was happening. I was shaking so hard I could barely speak, but Nancy was amazing, and she understood almost immediately. She snuck me out of the building and drove me in her car to the police station, where I showed officers the screenshots and filed a report. My co-workers later told me that Tim was there to inquire about the open designer position. He is not a designer. He had brought with him a portfolio and an elaborately fabricated work history that sounded legit. At the end of his interview, he casually asked if I still worked there. He said we used to collaborate. Oh, and he had written a song for me, and it had been picked up by the local radio this morning. He asked my co-workers to let me know with warmest regards. That phrase still makes my skin crawl. He then left, found my abandoned car in the parking lot, and paced behind it until the police arrived. Unfortunately, he wasn't enough of a public menace for police to bring him in that day. 
but the incident helped me to secure a restraining order against him. My company was amazing too. I was deeply embarrassed about my literally insane ex coming to the studio, but the CEO filed trespassing charges against him and created an action plan to keep me safe if it happened again. Not long afterwards, I moved to a different city, and that was that. Haven't heard from him since. But I discovered the most alarming part later. His roommate at the time, Liz, went through a similar experience with him during his breakdown, and when he compared notes much later, she said she had seen a large axe in Tim's car the same week it had all gone down. She said that she was worried about Tim's Facebook activity, so she removed the axe and hid it. Tim was so angry that he completely trashed their house and never came back. And if our timelines are correct, that must have been just before he came into my workplace for his interview. When I was about 12, I decided making a newspaper for my entire neighborhood was a really great idea. My friend and I were both at middle school and decided to get together once a month and write absolutely enthralling articles about the weather or when the pool would be open and then deliver our front slash back one page newsletter to every single house in our two street neighborhood whether they wanted it or not. We kept this up for about two years until the time of the story. So we were on our once a month paper route, if you could call, walking around our small neighborhood and putting a single sheet of paper in every mailbox a paper route. It was raining this particular time, so we had umbrellas and we were carefully walking to each mailbox, trying to keep our newsletter as dry as possible. This also meant all the cars that came by had their headlights and windshield wipers on, and also made sufficient noise with their tires splashing through the puddles. My point is that we knew when a car was approaching behind us. We were about halfway through on the street we weren't so familiar with, the one we didn't live on, when we noticed this souped up old white car coming really slowly up the street. Now, the way my neighborhood was set up, the only reason why you would be on the same street as us is if you lived there or you made a wrong turn. So there were even less cars on the street and the ones that passed usually were people that we knew. We continued walking from mailbox to mailbox while periodically checking to make sure the white car wasn't just parked. It was moving very slowly and the headlights and windshield wipers were either broken or just not turned on. This car drove slowly past us as we walked, going roughly the same pace as our steps if not slower. Something was so off about everything. There was no reason for this car to be on this road in the first place. We definitely didn't recognize it or the driver inside, and it was going so incredibly slow. Car trouble? I don't know. We pretended one of the houses was ours and walked up the driveway to avoid the car as it got close to us. It continued at the same pace and we watched it until it eventually disappeared around the corner. We laughed about it, thinking it was weird but nothing happened. It was all well and good until the car showed up at the end of the street behind us again, going just as slowly as it had before. What was this person doing? We were so confused and walked a little farther from the curb to avoid the car again as it came by. We didn't laugh about it this time. The car showed up a third time at the end of the street, and at this point we decided we should cut through some yards to get home. Better safe than sorry, right? We crossed the street, but the car passed again and we shrugged it off and kept going. The fourth time this car came around, it pulled up right next to us and the driver had his window down. Being 12 and living in a bubble, my friend and I hadn't really experienced shady people, but we knew something was up with this guy. He had a white towel draped over half his head, was wearing a white tank top, while we were in long sleeves and rain jackets, had his window down, and when he spoke his speech was slurred. We were polite and said hello and he asked us what we were doing through his open window. We continued walking as this interaction took place because we knew this dude seemed sketch, but at the same time we didn't want to assume anything and be rude. When we told him we ran a newspaper he immediately perked up and enthusiastically asked us about placing an ad. He also took his hands off the steering wheel and leaned over so he could get closer to the window. He smelled of cigarettes. My friend and I looked at each other, we knew something was wrong. We told him no, we don't place ads in our newspaper, even though we did. He told us we were pretty girls and probably cold. Our idea to cut through some yards was decided. We heard at least said something about needing to go home and he began shouting at us from inside the car as we crossed the street. We bolted to a neighbor's backyard when we heard the car begin to move quickly and hid in some bushes until we were sure the car was gone. We stopped writing our newsletter after that. Meeting a creepy person while you're alone in the rain in your own neighborhood was a good deciding factor for calling it quits. So, weird and probably high dude that try to talk to a 12 year old me and my friend, let's never meet again. To start off, I am a 16 year old female. Okay, I was visiting my mom's apartment for the weekend with my sister. We go there every weekend or every other weekend to see her. We arrived at about 10 in the morning and brought in our pillows and movies or whatever from my grandma's car. We get inside and chill there for a couple hours, watching TV, before my sister says that she's hungry. My mom asked, okay, what do you want? I said I was okay with having a pizza, and my mom said that she would have to run to Kroger's, which is less than a mile away. She said she would also get some movies from Redbox. My sister then asked if she could go with my mom to Kroger's. My mom said she could and asked if I would be okay in the apartment by myself. I said I would because I knew I would. I'll be gone in 20 minutes tops, my mom said. She didn't like leaving me alone, but she thought it would be okay as she told me later. Now, my mom's apartment is kind of in a crappy place. 
where people have been spotted with drugs and thieves and stuff, but I was on the third floor in one of the many surrounding apartment buildings, with tons of neighbors, I would be fine. Okay, lock the door, and you know not to open unless it's me. They left soon after, and I was sitting in the couch, on my phone with Jerry Springer playing in the background. It was about 10 minutes after they left when I heard the doorknob jiggle. I looked up, not feeling scared right away, but also feeling a little wary. I should mention that I carry a pocket knife everywhere with me and the blade is about 3-4 to four inches long. It was sitting on the coffee table in front of me when I got up to go to the door. I'm only 5 foot 3 and I knew not to open the door, so I grabbed a chair and stood on it to look through the peephole. That's when I got scared. On the other side was some guy, just standing there trying to open the door. Of course, being how I am, I try to laugh myself out of being afraid because I had no reason to think he was going to do something to me. Maybe he just had the wrong room. I'd never seen him before and I don't know everyone in the building personally, but I had seen them all at least once, and he wasn't one of them. Hey man, I think you got the wrong room. He froze, his eyes glued to the door handle, and then at the peephole. He probably could tell exactly where I was when I spoke. I swear we made eye contact and the whites of his eyes were so yellow I thought he had jaundice. Then he all of a sudden started ramming his shoulder into the door, like full on shoulder ramming like in football. I jump off the chair and grab my phone and knife and run into a room with a window and lock the door. I call my mom's friend who lives in the apartment building across the street and start crying hysterically and said, Jess, someone's trying to break in, call the cops, bring Chris, please just get over here. She didn't even hesitate, I'll be right there. Within seconds of hanging up, I call my mom. The guy is still hitting the door and he's yelling in frustration now. My mom picks up at after a few rings and I tell her what I told her friend and she was coming with Chris and she needed to get here quick. She was frightened and yelled that she was almost there. By the time I saw Jess make her way down two flights of stairs and across the road with her boyfriend, my mom was flying down the road and was there within mere seconds of me calling. They all race inside and I hear everyone yelling in the hallway. I unlock the door and peek outside of the apartment and see Chris holding the guy against the wall while my mom hugs me and Jess is screaming at him. Long story short, the police arrived and took my statement, and the man first denied it by saying, I thought it was my room, but then he ended up confessing that he wanted to see me and talk to me because he thought I was pretty. The police officers had him in handcuffs and ran a background check on him and what came up wasn't surprising. He had a warrant for an assault charge on a woman and had been arrested for kidnapping. Yeah, I hope I don't have to experience that again. Alright, so that's it. I hope you enjoyed this compilation. Let me know down in the comments below if you want to hear another one of these compilations every once in a while. But as always, have a nice day.